Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, the DN What If, with another fanfiction. This is the second part of What If Deku Became Japan's Guardian. All credits for this video go to their respective authors. So please support the real author. Check out the link in the description for more details. Please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Chapter 20, Training and Patrols. Summary, Red Hood starts learning under Green Shadow and sees what it's like to be his partner. Chapter Text. After her second day at school Izuku put the flash drive she gave him and hid it in his vault to examine later. He then opened the entrance to the green base and Himiko followed him. So what are we doing now? You don't patrol until nightfall. Himiko stated. Well you're talented Himiko, that much is obvious. And as your mentor and new older brother it's my duty to refine that talent and sharpen it. So we're going to train. Izuku explained as they stepped into a dojo within the base. Himiko smiled, she had a brother. A cool big brother. A fucking super badass brother. She won't disappoint him. She was determined not to. Izuku stood on one side of the sparring area with his arms crossed. He wasn't annoyed, disappointed or even concerned. He was just observing his sister's progress. Himiko on the other hand was dead tired. It's been over two hours and she couldn't even slightly touch him. He was strong like some adult bodybuilder. And as fast as a lightning bolt. Whenever she charges he's already countering, dodging or flipping her over his shoulder. So how was your day Izu? Melissa asked from the green computer as she was digging some dirt on someone of high position in the police. I'm exterminating our contract with the construction company we work with. Izuku declared while dodging Himiko's knife. Your strikes are still too savage. You leave yourself open. Izuku sidestepped her lunge and kneed her in the stomach. Gah. Toga yelped as she walked back. Oh, fucking hell. What? Why's that? Melissa asked but she had an idea since she knew Izuku for almost a year now. They're frauds, they do tax evasion, they lower the payment of their workers and make the customers pay more by taking longer. Izuku explained as he grabbed Himiko's wrist and judo slammed her to the ground. Fuck, Himiko yelped. Well any other companies in mind? Melissa asked but T since this is Izuku Midoriya he already had this planned out. Himiko picked up her knife and glanced around for a moment before disappearing. Izuku focused for a second before he backhanded the girl behind him who reappeared after the hit. You're fucking invincible. Himiko wailed. Yes I do. A small construction company in my prefecture that seemed to have a lot of financial struggling but honest people. Izuku another strike from Himiko. Their work is top quality and they follow all the protocols but the lack of speed for the lack of workers put them in a large debt. So I'm helping them. Izuku explained. Well cool. I trust your judgment Izu. Melissa explained. Izuku knocked the knife out of her hand. You're not holding it correctly. Darn it. Toga pouted. Himiko you need to get stronger, Izuku said. You have talent but it needs to be refined. What the hell does that mean? Toga asked nervously. It means that you're not leaving this cave for the rest of the day? Izuku said. F you 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 said Toga wailed in despair. Alfred prepare some food, energy drinks, and blood packs. Melissa sighed. Of course Lady Melissa, Alfred said as he went upstairs. I would advise you stay to make sure Master Izuku does not accidentally kill Lady Himiko. She won't die, Izuku said, but she'll feel like she is. Batoga cried as she fell to the floor for what felt like the millionth time today. You're a quick learner, Izuku said seemingly unfazed. You made large improvements in such a short time. It doesn't feel like it. Toga groaned. Izuku smiled. We're done for the day. Finally, Toga groaned. I know the feeling, Izuku said helping her up. You can have the blood now. In the blink of an eye, Toga descended on the cooler that Alfred had brought down. Toga eyed the blood hungrily, before quickly taking it and gulping it down. Lady Himiko, I've prepared a bath for you. Afterward I've prepared a meal for you, Alfred said. Alfred I love you. Toga groaned as she finished the blood. Alfred smiled before turning his head to Izuku. I've prepared a bath and meal for you as well Master Izuku. Are you going to come up willingly or do I need to wake Lady Melissa and have her make you? Melissa meanwhile had fallen asleep on the chair. No, I'll do it myself, Izuku said somewhat bashfully. Izuku walked towards Melissa before picking her up. I'll take her to bed first. Izuku said. He, you should probably wait for consent first. Toga snickered. Izuku's face turned slightly red. Very funny Himiko. He he, I made you blush. Himiko cheered. Now now. While Master Izuku may have his issues he would never do such a thing. Alfred said amusement evident in his tone. That being said if he were to ask Lady Melissa I don't. That's enough. Izuku said, his face now fully red. I'm going to take her to her room and put her into bed. Then I am going to leave. And for the record she's like my older sister. He turned and walked off. Of course Master Izuku. Alfred chuckled. Meanwhile, Toga was just giggling. I'll add that to your training Himiko. Izuku called cheerfully and Himiko paled in horror. After a meal, a nice bath and Melissa woke up from her nap everyone prepared for the night job. 
Melissa put on her earpiece and sit behind the computer. Izuku suited and Himeko stared at her new suit and all. Her sui was basically a red body suit with a kitten hoodie and new yellow goggles. They seemed to be advanced. She had a golden belt with gadgets similar to bunny and a dark cane. She had two knife holsters on her sides to complete the outfit. Glad you like it, Pinky worked hard on it. Izuku said looking through a case file. I love it. Emiko got confused. Who's Pinky? Emiko asked with a raised brow. Oh the first oracle, you'll meet her later. She stepped down when Melissa came to focus on studying for the UA entrance exam. She's a genius and I owe all of my gadgets when I debuted to her. Izuku explained with a fond smile on his face. Himeko beamed. Holy shit that's awesome. I want to meet her. Himeko said exited. Did you finish the green jet's new feature? Izuku asked as he pulled up his cowl and put on his face mask. Yup. Melissa said. New feature. Himeko questioned. An extra seat. Izuku explained. Stars appeared in Himeko's eyes. Yes. I can finally ride in the green jet. I call the front seat. Himeko exclaimed. Sorry but I haven't given you pilot training yet, Izuku said. Oh, uh, Toga deflated. Izuku patted her head, something that he learned she enjoyed very much. Don't worry, you'll get there one day. He smiled under his mask. As the duo got into the jet Izuku took the front seat while Himiko sit in the back with an exited grin on her cat-like face. As they took off Himiko felt sick from the speed. You get used to it in a night or two. Izuku informed her and she nodded her face as green as Izuku's costume. Izuku watched as Himiko took down a group of villains. One by one she knocked them out, punching them, slashing them, hitting them with the back of her knife. Izuku felt it was important that Himiko feels her progression, so he sent her after a bunch of random thugs in a safe house. Toga disappeared only to reappear behind another thug and knock him unconscious. Should she be using her quirk? Melissa asked. As long as she doesn't leave evidence, the only proof that she ever used her quirk is the word of a bunch of thugs, Izuku said. Izuku watched as Himiko took down the last thug. The red hood of kitten grinned before looking up at Izuku. Izuku nodded confirming that she did a good job. Yes, Toga cheered. Izuku jumped down next to Himiko. You performed as I expected, which is to say excellently. He <laughs> he, keep going, Himiko said, a proud smile on her face. Sorry to cut the praise fest but there's a robbery at a bank nearby. Melissa cut in. The bank is closed so no one else is there and no alarms are going off either. The only way I found out about it was because of our Robin drones. On it, Izuku said as he pressed a button on his belt and the green jet flew above them. Using their grappling guns they grappled into the jet and took off at top speed. Izuku watched with a proud smirk on his face as he used detective mode to observe Himiko's progress. And if she needed help in taking down the armed thugs, looks like I win the bet. Izuku said bluntly, but he was smirking. Himiko was really a natural at hiding and taking them one by one. This must have something to do with her cat-like features giving her a predatory instinct. Izuku mused to himself. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to come to the meeting with the board personally. Me and May will do that. Melissa said exasperated. But you'll be in a tablet founder, sound only of course. She added, fair enough. But I'm changing my voice. Izuku said with a shrug. It was at that moment Himiko came out of the bank with a proud grin on her face. Excellent performance Hood. Green Shadow complimented and Hood cheered. This was too easy. I hope we get something challenging. Hood said. And as if the world granted that wish the flat screen on the opposite building and all the TV channels across Japan started televising the same thing. Good evening citizens of Japan. I am Anarchy, voice of the people who will save this country from the plague of corruption and discrimination that befell this city, said the man on the TV who was wearing a red hooded vest and a mask that covered all his face. Izuku shot a very sheepish Himiko a glare. Great, another maniac to deal with. Chapter 21 Anarchy Summary Izuku has dealt with so much since he started as a vigilante so why is he surprised when a mad terrorist decides to blow up the country? Chapter Text Izuku sighed as he looked at the flat screen in the opposite building. Himiko was praying that he wasn't very bad but her hopes were crushed when he continued speaking. Citizens of Japan, your cries for help has been heard. I came to save this country from the plague of corruption and discrimination that befell this once great country. Anarchy clenched his fist in front of the camera. Because the people who are supposed to protect us wouldn't. The politicians who are elected and the heroes with licenses. They won't lift a finge to help anyone. And why would they? They've been bribed or just got busy with their own interests to care for anyone but themselves. Anarchy shouted. But it all ends today. I've planted three bombs where Musutafu's corruption is at its strongest. And by the end of the night they will be destroyed. And then the rest of Japan will follow this purge. Anarchy waved his hand now back to the brainwashing advertising and all that nonsense. Izuku sighed in annoyance. Great he got a crazy terrorist in his hands to deal with. And three bombs. How should he find them by the end of the night? Himiko on the other hand was worried. Does this happen a lot? Hood asked. It shouldn't happen at all. 
Green Shadow informed her, and then spoke into the Heer P.A.'s oracle have you watched? Yes it was all over the media. Someone must have hacked in there. Melissa explained. Well any info on this guy? Shadow asked. No nothing at all. He must be making his appearance just tonight. Oracle explained. And the bombs? Shadow asked. Well nothing either I'll try to find something. But it might take some time. Melissa said hesitantly. Green Shadow sighed well looks like they have no clues. Hey is that guy with anarchy because they wear the same mask? Hood pointed TP a man on the rooftop of the building with flat screen. He was wearing the same face mask as Anarchy that hid his entire face. Good job Hood. Shadow praised as they they grappled to that building. After landing both vigilantes walked to the man who held up his hand defensively. Well well. Easy now. I don't want to fight. I just have a message. The man said. Speak. Izuku said coldly. Well Anarchy says it's about time we get free. With the place where people lose everything to. Everyone will be free. No more homeless. No more poverty and no more rich scumbags that's it. You have 20 minutes but you should just leave it be. The man said. Green Shadow and Red Hood took off into the ledge of the building and grappled to the green jet. So what was that supposed to mean? Himiko asked. Izuku frowned they're targeting the central bank of the city. Izuku explained. The banks always cease the houses of those who don't pay. They sometimes fraud people into losing their money and even with thin those in top are the well paid off. Illegally of course. Izuku explained his deduction. Himiko stared at him in awe and Melissa giggled. Well you see now why he's the world's greatest detective. Melissa exclaimed. I'm sure it's just a joke in the public oracle. Izuku said. No way. Himiko protested. In school everyone speak about how you're the best detective ever for all the frauds you expose. Himiko defended. Well he's just a party pooper who never gives credit to himself. Melissa said and Himiko grinned. Well we gotta do something about it or he'll end like Mr. Gru. Himiko exclaimed and Melissa giggled. Who's Mr. Gru? Izuku asked confused. There was a pause. Izuku, you never the despicables? Melissa asked in worry. No, Izuku said bluntly and Himiko gasped. I never watch movies or TV shows, especially those for kids. Izuku explained. Well we gotta fix that. Himiko exclaimed. Yeah, movie night. Melissa said excited. No, I have to focus on both my works. I don't have time. Izuku said seriously. You gotta relax bunny. Himiko whined. I'll relax over some nice hot data. Izuku said. We'll get you to relax one day. Just you wait. Melissa swore and so did Himiko. The ride to the bank was quiet after that and they landed on the roof and activated detective mode. Ten men. All armed. We need to take them down together. How much time is left? Izuku asked. Five minutes. Melissa said. Shit. Go for the bomb bunny. I can turn invisible for a bit and Oracle will help me. You go for the bomb. Himiko said and Izuku wanted to protest but that was the most logical approach. Very well but be careful. Izuku instructed and the girl nodded. They split off. Green Shadow sneaked into the main office while Red Hood created a noise to attract the attention of the thugs. Izuku entered and looked at the bomb. It was an advanced digital bomb so he could hack it with his cryptographic sequencer. Pulling it out he connected to the device and started working. He searched through until he found the firewall and started decoding it. Almost two minutes later just as one minute was left the bomb was disarmed. Sighing in relief Izuku spoke in his earpiece. I did it. He said and the two girls sighed in relief. Good job bunny, Kemko and Melissa said through the earpiece. As the two went to the rooftop of the bank they saw another guy waiting for them. Himiko pulled a bunch of explosive discs to be careful and Izuku walked to the guy. What's your message? Izuku asked. The man scoffed. Well anarchy's right. The cops are as corrupt as they come. We're better of without them. The man said and the duo took off to the jet. Even I could guess that he was meaning the police force building. Himiko said and Izuku nodded. Oracle make a scan in the building and connect me to Naomasa. Izuku said and Melissa agreed. Hello, is that you Shadow? Niyamasa asked. Sukachi get everyone out of the building. Anarchy put a bomb there. I'm two minutes away and I'll disarm it. Wait, I'll call the bomb squad. No time. You have less than ten minutes. Arg. Fine, but don't get hurt. Thank you for the cooperative attitude. I'll be out in few minutes. The connection was cut off. Oracle, you found the bomb. Izuku asked. Yes, on top of the building. Behind the entrance so no one would see it. Melissa said and Izuku smiled. What would I do without these two? Izuku asked himself. As they landed on the roof they searched and found the bomb. And Izuku went to disarm it. Once he did and he still had another four minutes Himiko squeaked and he looked to see her pointing to a bomb in a trash bin. Bunny, another one and only six minutes left. Haliko shouted. Well shit, it still had six minutes so he hurried over. Thankfully he was able to disarm this one too. Oracle tell Captain Naomasa to get back in with his men. Izuku said. Right on it boss. Melissa said and Izuku frowned. I'm not the boss. In fact you are. Izuku said and Melissa sighed. I'm just messing around and you should look for the third guy by now. 
Melissa said through the earpiece. Nodding Izuku looked around with his detective mode but found no one. You think we have to find the last one ourselves? Hiliko asked worried. Well let's go. Izuku said simply and Himiko gaped. You know where it is? Himiko asked baffled. As they got in the jet Izuku nodded. So where is it Sherlock Holmes? Melissa asked. Well Watson it is obvious that they are targeting the places of corruption. The banks is for industry. The police building is for law. Which means that the next target is politics which means Izuku waited. It's the city hall. Melissa and Himiko exclaimed in unison. I'm searching right now. Excellent job bunny. Melissa said happily. And you say you're not the best. Himiko said and Izu sighed. As they got in they had to sneak in without being noticed and the worst is that they didn't know when it would go off. Well guys it's in the mayor's office. Melissa said and they went to the top floor. While they landed on the roof it was the closest. I shut down the security cameras so go in quickly. Melissa said in a hurry and they did. After they got in the bomb still had two minutes. Himiko panicked while Izuku quickly went to work. With a sigh he stopped it a second before the time ran out. Himiko slumped in the mayor's chair and Izuku let out a sigh of relief. Then something entered his communications. Well it seems that you stopped all of my bombs. Anarchy said through the earpiece and Izuku shrugged. Sorry to disappoint you. Izuku said uncaringly. Disappoint me. Not at all. Come to the courthouse so we can complete this city's trials. Anarchy said and Izuku sighed. As they were dropped on the roof opposite to the courthouse, Green Shadow and Red Hood were watching the big amount of men around. You get in. I'll deal with the guys. Himiko said cheerfully. You sure? Izuku asked and she nodded. As they split off Izuku glided to the balcony of the courthouse and got in just as heard the sound of fighting going off in the distance. As he got into the main courtroom he found Anarchy waiting for him. I didn't know you had a partner. Anarchy said. She's new on the job. Green Shadow answered. Well I invited you here to talk. You see I want. Cut the nonsense. I'm here to take you in. Green Shadow as he threw an electric disc the man avoided. Well I guess you want to fight. Anarchy launched a blast of fire that Izuku dodged but the blast turned to attack him again. Izuku didn't expect that and was partially hit. Good thing the suit was s fire resistant Borv would have been fried. Izuku narrowed his eyes. Even Endeavor can't control the fire like that. He doesn't have a fire launcher. Does he have two quirks? But how? Izuku jumped between walls with his jet boots to avoid the flames. Hold still. Anarchy shouted. It would be illogical to do that. Izuku stated matter of factly. How do you have two quirks? Izuku asked. I ID don't. The man stuttered and Izuku had a bad feeling. He kept dodging until he noticed that Anarchy was getting slower and less effective in his attacks. Then launched himself and kicked Anarchy on the back of his head knocking him out. The weakness of fire quirks is that it gets you overheated when used too much. Izuku muttered. Anarchy groaned to see Green Shadow glaring coldly at him and stiffened. Well time to unmask you. Izuku said as he took the guy's mask off. You're just a kid. Izuku trailed off realizing the irony of that. So, what does it matter? Anarchy asked. Well whatever brat. Tell about the Sakon quirk, and I'll negotiate you for evidence. Izuku said coldly. I'm not telling Anarchy froze as he felt Izuku's killing intent that was too suffocating. Speak. Izuku growled. See the Boogaman gave me this fire quirk. He said I should get rid of you and he even gave me the bombs. Anarch blurted out. Anything you know outside the Boogaman? Izuku asked. If I tell you will you let me go? Anarchy asked. You have my word. Izuku promised. Anarchy took a deep breath. The Yakuza are having a meeting in three months. They got a new source for a project. What project? Izuku narrowed his eyes. Quirk erasing bullets. Anarchy said. Well shit. He'll have to restart digging on the Yakuza again. Well you can leave. Izuku cut the ropes and let him go. You sure it was good idea to let him go? Melissa asked as Izuku and Himiko were back at the green base. I got his name and fingerprints with detective mode when we spoke. I gave it to the cops. Izuku explained. The girls giggled. He was evil sometimes and he knew it. As they exited the girls dragged him somewhere just to find Kaken and Mei-chan waiting. Hey nerd. How the fresh f fuck you never watched a fucking Disney movie? Katsuki shouted in disbelief. Are you sure you're human bunny? Mei asked worried. Is it really a big deal? Izuku asked exasperated. Yes. Everyone shouted. I don't remember having this built. Izuku said looking around at the theater that had apparently been in his house this entire time. Sometimes you can be so preoccupied about what happens everywhere else you don't pay attention to what happens in your own home, Melissa said. What are we watching? What are we watching? Toga asked impatiently, a bucket of popcorn in one hand and a cup filled with blood in the other. We are going to watch Minions, Melissa said picking up the remote and turning on the movie. Himiko and Mei who are now instant besties cheered while Katsuki grinned. Behold the comedy nerd, Katsuki exclaimed. As the rest of the night went on Izuku focused on his abnormal family but still family and smiled at their happiness. This is what he fights to protect. Chapter 22 A Nice Cute Machai 
Summary. Izuku meets the construction company owners, a nice couple and their daughter who leaves an impression on him. Chapter Text. Izuku was looking through the blueprints for the cancelled project with the old construction company he worked with. He was mad for all the frauds cases and got it shut down. After that he decided to work with honest people and as he searched he stumbled on the Yurakas. They were a married couple that owned a small company that was having struggles in the past. The family lived in poverty from the very beginning and it bothered him and made him suspicions. Their work was good and they always follow the protocols so why were they struggling? He searched after he dealt with anarchy and boy he was enraged. The bigger companies were sabotaging their work and sending delinquents to scare them. They messed with their reputation and kept them down. All that in secret. So what does any sane person in his position do? Call the cops of Kaos. But Izuku was a petty person when he wanted to be and right now he wanted. So he used his own influence and money as well as his own fists to get all the companies who dared to harm this innocent family shut down. Seeing the owners of the companies being dragged to the police cars was a sight Izuku will treasure. Well we're here Master Izuku. Alfred spoke bringing Izuku out of his thoughts. Izuku looked to see that Alfred has just parked the car. Nodding Izuku exited the limousine and grabbed his tablet and blueprints. Are you sure you want me to drop you a full train right away sir? Alfred asked and Izuku nodded. Yes, they're not very well off so I didn't want to freak them out. Izuku explained and Alfred nodded in understanding. After that he entered the train station and entered the train that'll take him to the Yurakas. As he entered he felt someone running behind to catch the train and he kept the doors open for them. And few seconds later a girl his age stumbled in and fell. Izuku caught her in his arms and looked at her. The girl had a brown hair cut in a bob, rosy cheeks with a permanent blush on them and brown eyes. She was also panting heavily which means that she was running. Are you alright? Izuku asked concerned. The girl gave him a thumbs up and nodded still trying to catch her breath. The girl noticed that he dropped his papers to catch her and that he was still holding her. Blushing she moved away and started collecting his blueprints and he knelt down to help her. Sit down a little Miz I'll grab them. I'm Deku Shimura by the way. Izuku assured her but she shook her head. Oh my name is Achako Yuraka and you dropped them because you kept the doors open for me. Achako blushed and caught me when I tried. Izuku was surprised. Well that's why she looks familiar. She looks like a copy of Mrs. Yuraka. Izuku mused to himself. Are you the son of a businessman or something? Achako asked and Izuku nodded. While it was the truth, Hasashi Midoriya was a well-known name the USA. Yes, I'm and I'm going to the Yuraka's construction company. Basically your parents I assume. Izuku asked knowing the answer. Achako blushed. Yes they are. And why are you going to my parents? Achako asked. Izuku could see the hope in her eyes and he felt anger. Not at the poor girl of course. But the scumbags who put her family in so much hardships. He now felt good about shutting down the companies. Oh it's a pleasant surprise I promise. I heard that you guys got a lot of work recently. Izuku said giving the best smile he could. The girl's face lit up. Oh yes. After the other companies were shut down the workers came to ours. And the people who were frauded did so too. Achako said excited and Izuku smiled, knowing that he put a smile on the faces of a wronged family made him warm inside. He was brought out of his thoughts when the train stopped. As they exited the train Izuku noticed the heavy bag she was carrying and all the blueprints of her own. Here, let me help you. Izuku grabbed the bag and started carrying her. Wait it's too heavy. You don't have to do that. Achako protested but Izuku waved her off. It's fine. I like to exercise whenever possible. Izuku said casually but Achako still felt bad. You have a nif's name Shimura-kun. Achako said and Izuku raised brow. Thanks I like my family name. Izuku answered. I meant Deku. Izuku let her finish her thoughts before judging. Maybe she doesn't know what it means. How so? Izuku asked. Well it reminds of Dekaru which means you can do it. Achako said in her bubbly way and Izuku was speechless. He took that name to spite others. He used because he hated it. And this random girl just gave it a whole new meaning. Well he hopes he gets to see her more. For some reason he felt like getting her something. As they walked Izuku noticed the pink pads on her fingers. Is that your quirk? Izuku asked. Yeah, it's called zero gravity. When I touch something with the five fingers in one of my hands it loses the gravity effect. Achako explained with enthusiasm. Her bubbly personality was endearing to be honest. They reached the fairly small company after a five minutes of walking from the station. After coming inside Izuku walked with Yuraka into the office of the Yurakas. He knocked on the door and heard a come in so he opened the door and Achako greeted her parents cheerfully. Hello mom and dad, Achako said in the probably the happiest tone he heard in his life. How can she be so happy with all the trouble her family is dealing with? Izuku saw how the couple brightened up to see their daughter coming to visit. Hey there my little machai, Mr. Yuraka said cheerfully and Achako blushed. Daddy, Achako pouted and Izuku found it cute. Was he a cat person? Well damn right after all his sister was a cat-like girl. What are you doing here Achako? 
Mrs. Uraraka asked with a smile and Achako gave them the blueprints. Oh my god I forgot those at home. Mrs. Uraraka said in pain. Thank you dear. Mrs. Uraraka said with a sigh of relief. It was then that the couple noticed him. Mr. Uraraka looked at him suspiciously since Izuku came with his daughter. Who are you? Mr. Uraraka asked not unkindly but sternly. Deku Shimura, I had an appointment to discuss matters with you. Izuku said swiftly. The couple shared a glance. Aren't you too young for working? Mrs. Uraraka asked confused. I'm as old as I look and know I'm old enough to work. You see because of the high rate of suicide for quirkless people the government put a law that puts the quirkless people considered adults at the age of 12. We can marry, own houses and companies as well as have driving licenses. I'm almost 14 now so the rule implies on me. Izuku explained and the family was baffled. Not to be rude but can we look up the actual law quickly? Mrs. Hirorakas asked and Izuku nodded in understanding. Of course, take your time. Izuku smiled reassuring them. After a quick googling turns out he was right. You have a driving license? Achako asked and Izuku nodded. Yes but usually the butler drives me and shield to anywhere. Izuku answered. You have a butler. Achako tried not to scream. You know Melissa Shield? The couple exclaimed. Izuku nodded. Well yeah, we kind of share the company and the mansion. The family fainted when he said mansion. Shit. Arg. What happened? Achako asked to see Izuku crouching in front of her. He was holding a glass of water to her. What happened? Achako asked embarrassed. You guys fainted when I said the word mansion. Are you okay? Izuku asked concerned. Achako found that sweet. Yeah, I'm really sorry. You just caught us off guard. Achako said bashfully. She noticed that she was laying on the small couch while her parents were still out on the chairs. I'm sorry. That's the reason I came on foot and not a limo. Achako fainted again. God. Damn. Endeavor. Achako woke up again as did her parents to see Deku giving them a deadpan look. I'm going to shut and let you guys speak. No need to faint please. Izuku said and the family felt embarrassed. You can speak. Mrs. Hiroraka said with a blush from the embarrassment. I want to work with you. As in a partnership. I need you to build me some expansive labs and apartment complexes. I'm paying in cash. Izuku said and the family of three looked at each other. You're serious? Mr. Uraraka asked. Yes. Wait don't you dare the family fainted again. He was starting to consider speaking word by word if they were going to faint every few seconds. Well this is all. Izuku said as he finished discussing the projects with the Uraraka's. Well how should we travel from here to Musutafu? Mr. Uraraka mused to himself. I'm more than willing to give an apartment complex to you and the workers. Izuku explained. Why us though? Mrs. Uraraka asked in confusion. You could have went to a company in your prefecture but why come here? The woman asked. Izuku shrugged. I was looking for a good people to work with and I stumbled on you guys. A small company but your work is top quality. So I decided to work with you. Izuku said. And when are we going to move? Achako asked curious. When you finish your school year so around two weeks. Izuku said and the family nodded. The parents bowed and Achako followed their example. Thank you for all your kindness. They said in unison. Izuku's face burned red. Please get up. I don't like formalities. Izuku said waving his arms frantically. Well I guess we'll get rid of the debts. Mrs. Uraraka cheered and the, the two others followed her example. Oh I already solved that problem. You're clean. Izuku said casually and the trio stared at him blankly. Oh hell no don't the trio fainted for the third time that day. God. Damn. Endeavor. Chapter 23. Occult School. More like a fucking quirk supremacist cult. Summary. Izuku was a great detective. Even though he denies it he is. And as a great detective it was high time he discovers that the country was rotten by the ideals of an old quirk supremacist cult. Notes. Chapter Text. Izuku had just came back from his talk with the Uraraka's. They fainted too many times he felt like he was messing with them. As he entered the manor he went straight to his study. He still needs to view the things in the flash drive. And investigate Aldera thoroughly. With a sigh he slumped into his chair in front of the computer. Himiko copied a lot of footage. It was going to be a long evening. Melissa had important tests in UA and Himiko was hanging out Kakin so it was only him and Alfred. He grabbed the first flash drive and put it into his computer then started playing the footage. Izuku was infuriated. The kids with mutant quirks and weak quirks are picked on. Those with strong ones are left to do whatever they like to do and even in front of the teachers. It wasn't natural. He knows what discrimination is and he dealt with it. Katsuki was sugarcoating his talk or he thought it was normal. Actually he went to Aldera District from the beginning so he couldn't tell the difference. But Himiko did and she got him a whole lot of footage. Footage that made his blood boil. Patience. If he let his anger control him he'll get sloppy and make mistakes. This is just junior high and Katsuki told him that elementary school sucked as much so it's logical to assume that the high school in the district is as bad if not worse. So he'll have to be careful and think his moves closely. 
But the question is why? Why did no one sue the district? Turns out they did. A lot of parents did sue the school but it went down badly and Aldera got away scot-free. Heck when another school sued them that school was forced to make a public apology to the school. It wasn't normal. At also he'll dig on and see what he finds starting with the legal teams of Aldera. Izuku's suspicions were confirmed as he started digging into the info. Aldera had some very expansive legal teams. It wasn't logical for a no-name school to be able to afford such legal teams. You need some rest sir, or at least a treat. Alfred said as he gave Izuku a tray with coffee and some cookies. Izuku smiled in appreciation at the old butler. Thank you Alfred. Izuku said as he grabbed the coffee cup and sipped. You look mad sir. Is everything alright? Alfred asked. Well I don't understand how can Alder afford the best legal teams in the country. Izuku said as he was searching their data. Maybe they have sponsors in the shadows sir. Alfred offered. Izuku's eyes widened at the realization. Excellent job Alfred. That's it. I'll look into their records and see who's supporting them. Izuku exclaimed with renewed energy and Alfred chuckled. Good to know I helped sir. Call me if you need anything. Alfred said as he left the room. Izuku focused his attention on the legal teams instead of the cases themselves. He hacked into their records and looked to see if there was any connections he could find. Izuku scowled as he looked at the data. It was just as he suspected. The funders of Alder was the Detranet Lifestyle Company, a company ran by one Rokia Yatsubashi. Izuku personally disliked the guy. He made it clear in the one time he and Melissa met him in a party they went to that the guy hated the quirkless. He was strange and Izuku felt something shady about the guy. It made no sense. Why would he have a school full of quirkiest teachers and waste money on them? Is he advertising for quirkiest attitude? Damn it it's like he's part a part of some quirk supremacist cult. Wait a second. Alfred can you come for a sec? Izuku called through the microphone in his desk. A minute later Alfred came holding a tray with a full cup of coffee and some more cookies. To be fair Izuku finished it all and needed more anyway. How can I help you sir? Alfred asked. I need your knowledge since someone of your age is more knowledgeable than me. Izuku said and Alfred nodded. Of F course sir. Ask away. Alfred said. Was there any quirk supremacist cults in Japan in the past? I mean ones that was very known. Izuku asked and the old butler frowned. Something was up. Yes I'm afraid there was. They were called the Meta Liberation Army. A quirk supremacist cult that had a big problem with the restrictions on quirk usage. They also had a problem with the quirkless and those with weak quirks. They valued power and the government took them down decades ago. The leader's name was Destro and he was arrested where he died in prison. Alfred explained and Izuku finally found all the pieces of the puzzle. And now it all made sense. Alfred, what was Destro's name? Izuku asked suspiciously. Alfred frowned. My old memory doesn't serve me right. I only know that his last name was Yatsubashi. Alfred flinched as Izuku slammed his fist on the desk cracking it slightly. Izuku sighed. Sorry Alfred. I think we are dealing with another Destro or a Destro Jr. to be precise. Izuku frowned. I'll prepare more coffee for you then. Alfred declared as he left the room. Izuku was furious. Alder was one of many indoctrination facilities all over the city and possibly the whole country. It was disturbing and he'll have to get the pros into this as much as he hated the idea. But how and who can he trust? Well midnight. Present Mike and Eraserhead are on the list so the UA faculty count. All Might too as well as Ingenium and Best Genus. But he needs some physical evidence. Maybe he'll break into Aldera and... The door to the room was kicked open by a furious Himiko. She seemed mad for some reason as she stomped to his desk and slammed a book on his desk. It was old and worn out. Me and Bakun are attending a fucking cult school. Himiko exclaimed. Izuku grabbed the book in two pages and he knew it was one of the books Destro wrote. Izuku was hoping she found it with one of the faculty members. I found this in the principal's office. Himiko declared. Izuku grinned as he patted his sister on the head. Good girl. Now I can take down this entire cult for good. Izuku declared and Himiko enjoyed the patting like a cat and even started purring in satisfaction. Now he had to gather the heroes for a meeting. All Might was doing a patrol in the streets looking for crime until something caught his eye and he jumped into a rooftop. He blinked as he looked in front of him in confusion for a few seconds. Then he gave his signature laugh. H -o -h -o -h -a. I didn't expect to meet you here young man. You seemed like a night person. All Might declared. Relax sir. No need to waste your three hours in sitting. Izuku spoke and All Might looked at him seriously. How do you know about that young man? All Might demanded. Stop wasting your precious time and I'll answer all your questions. Izuku said and All Might was covered in steam for a few seconds to show a skeleton old man. This dot this something I count and hope to prepare for. Izuku spake honestly. Tashinori sighed then smiled. Yes, that's what I'm now. A weak old man who could barely fight for three hours or four. Tashinori said with shame. You're still a hero who saved hundreds of lives. I suggest you look for a successor soon and retire. Izuku spoke and Tashinori coughed blood. Izuku handed him a handkerchief and the man gratefully accepted it. How? Tashinori asked. 
You're the world's greatest detective but this is absurd. How did you find out? Tashinori asked. He seemed more curious than anything. I need to see some other people so long story short my grandmother Nana was your mentor and I stumbled on one for all when I searched her history. Tashinori puked blood at that. My grandmother has grandchildren. Izuku nodded and stood up. Meet me in the UA meeting room and when this is over we'll talk as a family. Izuku spoke in gentle tone and All Might nodded. Ingenium was running across the streets looking for crime until he took a turn into an alleyway after seeing someone he recognized. He looked at the emergency stairs and saw someone who everyone knows. Pleasure meeting you Green Shadow. Ingenium said cheerfully with his fists on his hips. Izuku jumped down and fafts the armored hero. Tensei Ida, pro hero Ingenium. I need your help. Izuku spoke. Really? You don't seem like the type to seek help. Ingenium remarked. Well it's not really my issue but the government. Meet me in the UA meeting room and we'll talk in detail along other pros. Izuku threw a smoke bomb and as Ingenium started to cough and when the smoke dispersed green shadow was already gone. I need to fight more ninjas. Ingenium declared as he went back to his patrol. Hello best genist. It's truly an honor to meet you. Izuku said as he looked at the man. They were both in his office. You don't seem to mind my presence. Izuku remarked. You don't break the law and I can't arrest you. Plus I am nothing like those corrupt so I have nothing to worry about. Best genus shrugged. True. Meet me in the UA meeting room tonight for an important declaration. Izuku said before jumping from the window. He already texted the principal to gather the staff so now it was time to prepare. Prepare for war. Chapter 24. A war meeting. Summary. The pros and green shadow meet up for a war meeting to discuss the terrorist organization that's been rotting this country for god knows how long. Chapter text. The staff of UA were sitting on chairs the U-shaped table. The racer head. Present Mike, Midnight, Vlad King, Snipe, Ectoplasm, Cementos, Power Loader and Principal Nedzu were sitting waiting for their guest. May I know why is there three extra chairs? Ectoplasm asked confused as was the rest of the teachers. Well our guest informed Mimi that we'll have more than one guest tonight for this meeting. Nedzu answered simply with his usual smile. Who else is coming? The racer head asked. He had really bad feeling about this. Green Shadow invited other pros he trusts to this meeting. Nedzu's face became serious and the teachers picked on that. It seems that Green Shadow has detected a danger on the national level and that's why he called this meeting. Nedzu explained and the teachers grew anxious. Well, good to know that Green Shadow is ready to ask for help when needed and not just face the problems head on. Vlad King spoke his opinion. The racer had let out a huff. I met the boy. He's paranoid. He doesn't trust easily and likes to work alone. But he's not reckless. He seems to be the type to analyze situations and make the most logical approach. Eraserhead nodded to himself. A wise kid indeed. Everyone stared at Eraserhead in stunned silence. You never gave that much praise to anyone before. Mike said shocked and everyone nodded. Scowling Eraserhead was about to say something. The doors suddenly were flung open and everyone saw All Might in his hero gear. H-O-H-O-H-A. I am here. To attend the meeting on Green Shadow's invitation. All Might declared and everyone except Nedzu were surprised. All Might. The teachers asked more confused than surprised. Never thought Green Shadow was the type to get someone as flashy as you into the matter. Power Loader commented. Then two more figures entered the room. Best Genist and Ingenium entered. The former nodded in greetings and the later waved cheerfully. As everyone took a seat they just waited for Green Shadow to arrive and about five minutes later Midnight spoke. It's rude to call us here then be late. Midnight huffed in annoyance. Maybe he got distracted by muggers and bank robberies on his way. Mike said cheerfully. Wait, how would he get in? Since asked as he was about to get up. I'm actually right here. Everyone's head snapped to the ceiling where Green Shadow was standing upside down on the ceiling looking at them. Since when were you there? The racer head asked surprised. Since before you came. Green Shadow jumped down and landed on his feet gracefully. Why were you there little listener? Mike asked confused. Well to make it clear I was making sure that everyone here is the real people not decoy. By watching your interaction with each other I was able to tell that none of you is an agent working for someone else. Green Shadow explained. Kinda paranoid don't you thin partner? Snipe asked a bit weirded out. Quirks are very versatile. It's illogical to assume that none of you could be replaced by someone who can change their form. I personally know someone who can take any of your appearances and teach here for a whole day without anyone suspecting a thing. Green Shadow explained which worried everyone. Green Shadow's paranoia aside. What's this meeting about? The racer asked. Green Shadow nodded. Straight to business. I respect that. Green Shadow said and much to everyone's surprise he bowed. Thank you all for accepting my invitation. It's really good to know that I have some of your trust. Green Shadow said and everyone nodded with a smile. Then his face became serious. Now let's speak about a matter that's caught my attention. A matter that's a threat to the national security of Japan. Izuku said and everyone tensed. Would you be more specific young man? All Might asked and Green Shadow nodded. 
He put a small table in front of everyone to see and put a metal disc similar to the ones UA uses for their acceptance letters. A projection appeared and everyone could see what seemed like a school. If everyone would be so kind watch to the end for 10 minutes and then I'll explain. Green Shadow said as he played the videos of kids in Aldra and other schools he personally hacked assault, insult, harass and used their quirks on weaker kids. The room became tense as the heroes watched in silent horror and rage the acts of quirkism and violence against mutant quirks, weak quirks and god especially some quirkless kids and in front of the teachers of said schools. The teachers of UA were seething. Nedzu's fur was standing on the edges and the three guests were obviously enraged. By the end of the ten minutes everyone seemed like they were going to personally storm into those schools and burn it. Did Izuku blame them? He was half considering just burning those schools and call it a day but it wasn't that easy. So, how's this related to nation security? I mean thank you for showing me this but elaborate. Nedzu said trying to keep his mind cool. Nodding Green Shadow pressed a button on his belt and the screen showed some files. The thing in common between these schools are the ideals, the extreme quirkism, the negligence, the favoritism towards strong quirks and hatred towards weak quirks and quirkless people. These schools are connected. It's a cult chain of schools across the prefecture and the whole country, a quirk supremacist cult. Izuku explained and everyone gasped in shock. How? Mike shouted in disbelief. How didn't they get shut down? A racer had asked feeling that there's more to it. Because these schools are being funded and protected by very powerful legal teams. Teams paid by the Detranet Lifestyle Company. Izuku said, Wait a second, Detranet. What does this have to do with them? Ingenium asked shocked and confused. Well have any of you heard of the Metal Liberation Army? Izuku asked calmly. While they were a terrorist quirk supremacist cult, the racer had trailed off as the realization dawned on them. Shit, shit, the MLA are making a comeback. Power Loader yelled in disbelief. Do you have any proof? Medzu asked knowing the answer. Green Shadow walked to them and handed the mammal a book. After a couple pages he understood that this was serious. Thank you for your efforts young man. We'll handle this. All Might spoke up and everyone nodded. Green Shadow handed them a bag of flash drives. I compiled the evidence on all the schools in the prefecture and some possible contacts of the MLA. The leader of this organization is Rikia Yatsubashi and he resides in Deka City, a base full of his followers. I did what I can now dealing with national threats is the job of the military not mine. Green Shadow and everyone nodded in understanding and appreciation. Thank you Green Shadow you really are Vlad King started. The world's greatest detective I get that a lot but it's not true. I just did what I could. But I should have tried to investigate this suspicious quirkism act sooner than today. Izuku said with a sigh. Everyone stayed silent for a bit. Bunny, Midnight started not believing her ears. Did you really start the investigation and get all this evidence in one day? Midnight asked and Green Shadow nodded a bit confused by their uneasiness. Well young man we are very grateful for all your help but we need to discuss this with the authorities now. Thus Genus said and Green Shadow nodded in understanding. Dropping a smoke pellet he disappeared by the time the smoke dispersed. Please tell me I'm not the only one fascinated by the ninja stunts. Ingenium said and most teachers and even All Might nodded. After Green Shadow brought them the files, Nedzu had been poring over the security footage. There was evidence. So, so much evidence that Nedzu could likely get Aldera Jr. High shut down within the hour. But Nedzu would never settle for a small victory in this case. His fur bristles, his teacup rattling as his paw shakes. These monsters will pay. They will make sure of that. Patience. Nenzu takes a deep breath. Anger will only make him sloppy. As frustrating as it is, Nenzu knows that this situation is delicate. If he acts carelessly, the older district will burn the junior high to save the elementary and high school. He'll need a significant offense, preferably more than one. That would justify investigating the district itself and not the school. Criminals are much like bugs, Nenzu finds. The moment a threat presents itself, they scurry out of sight to continue another day. Nenzu will not give them that other day. And that's just Aldera. The rest of schools, the MLA and all of the followers are going to be hard to deal with. They must make the best battle strategy. A week later they were gathered again to discuss the matter more thoroughly. Ingenium and Best Genus couldn't make but it was fine. As you all know Destro's army was eventually defeated. And most of its members incarcerated. Nedzu responds. Most of, says Shouda. Nedzu nods. Indeed, Destro in fact had a son. A second wave of shock sweeps through the staff. It was the opinion of the government at the time that the child should not bear the sins of his father. Nenzu pulls several papers out of the file he placed on the desk. As it turns out, a closer eye perhaps was warranted. The survivors of his father's army thought he should carry Destro's legacy instead. They raised Destro's son, Rikia Yatsubashi, to lead a new metal liberation army, one which he has raised in secret. Everyone nods as they already knew that. But now they were wondering what to do to deal with the danger. This MLA are no joke after all if Green Shadow considers it a threat they believe it's of the highest caliber. 
As it turns out, the legal firm representing the Aldera staff is owned by the Detneret Company, of which Yatsubashi is the CEO. Nenzu retrieves more papers from the file. There is also a tangible financial connection between each Aldera staff member and Detneret. In other words, every member of staff is a member of this new MLA movement. It's a rather elegant plan. If they encounter students who have a reasonable chance at heroics, they groom the child to believe in MLA values. Meanwhile, the other students, when taken out of their influence, will feel oppressed when they are suddenly forced to follow public quirk use laws, likely finding their way to the MLA proper. All this info represented by Green Shadow over the past week, Nedzu explained. God bless the young vigilante and his ability to gather info. Now they had every indoctrination facility all over Japan. A hollow silence fills the room, the implications settling. How many? asks Hizashi. Nedzu grimaces. Based on what I could find tracing financial records. 40,000. Perhaps more. Fuck. Shouter runs a hand through his hair. Next to him, Hizashi's clenching his fists tight enough that his knuckles are completely white. Yagi coughs blood. Kayama looks sick, and Ken isn't far behind her. Were this a few years ago, I would offer to dismantle this Yatsubashi's insurrection myself, Yagi says. But I cannot say in confidence that three hours is enough time. Three hours is plenty. Nedzu smiles. Sometimes, Shouta forgets that Nedzu is not only an animal, but an animal who has experienced some of the worst humanity has to offer. This smile reminds him. After all, we only need to worry about Yatsubashi himself. His army isn't our problem. Excuse me. Kan voiced. We are heroes, Kan, not soldiers. We do not fight in wars. Nedzu responds, his grin widening. We have a perfectly good military for that. And with that the end of one of Japan's biggest threats was coming to an end. Chapter 25 The End of Destro's Ideals Summary We see the Japanese military take down the MLA with the help of the top two heroes. Redestro and his goons stand no chance. Chapter Text When Nedzu presented his case to the government, he almost immediately received support from the Ministry of Intelligence to identify MLA members, a task he took to with gusto. Names, addresses, ages, blood type, Nedzu found as much as he could on as many operatives as he could find. The operation was straightforward enough. Strike teams, with two heroes as backup as a precaution, would strike at Meta Liberation Army sympathizers across Japan in preparation for a final raid on Yatsubashi himself. Nimuri stands next to Kan, both in costume. Across the street, the Japanese military ambushes a small pack of MLA forces attempting to reach the airport on foot. Nedzu was right. They didn't even need us. Kan laughs, watching the soldiers subdue the last of the Metal Liberation soldiers as they attempted to flee down the street. Probably for the best that way. Heroes are public servants. Using us in armed conflict would set a dangerous precedent. Nimuri replies, That might be an interesting topic of discussion for my art history classes. True enough. Kan turns. I just hope everything goes this smoothly. Emiko and Katsuki were having lunch together to celebrate putting some bullies from high school in their place. It was almost too easy but hey who doesn't like to be treated to free desserts by the victims. It was a nice plus. We kicked their worthless weak asses so bad fangs. Katsuki chuckled. Yup. And today will only get better. Himiko exclaimed and Katsuki raised a brow as she started a countdown. As she reached the one pro heroes and police officers raided the school and started arresting teachers and bullies left and right. Katsuki looked at the kitten cackling in front of him with that hot predatory grin and thought of one thing. I will fucking marry this girl he silently declared. Redistro straightens his jacket. Over the past 48 hours, his Metal Liberation Army has been besieged, and for the life of him, he has no idea who is responsible. MLA cells around Japan suddenly went dark. Reports from his supporters and executive positions stopped. Some of his more high-profile allies dropped off the map. His pro-hero supporters had been called away by the HPSC, then vanished. Someone had hit him hard and they hit him fast. Anyone sent to investigate never returned. Even Tomoyasu had vanished when he insisted on locating Hanabata. Too subtle for the Yakuza. Too quiet for the heroes. Too large scale for a villain organization to go undetected. Government. Yatsubashi thought in confusion. No I was too subtle. It would take the best of detectives to even know about and then it clicked. Green Shadow Yatsubashi growled. Kazuki, what's our status? He asks. Of his top brass, only he and Kazuki remained. The two of them had gone to ground at the central tower of Deka City, along with 5,000 soldiers. They were now one of a handful of Meta Liberation Army forces he could account for. We lost communications with another cell, the Hasu branch. No response since. She bites her thumb. What could possibly be happening out there? What indeed, Rita Stro mutters. The thought that his dear comrades may be lost brings tears to his eye. A shrill alarm blares throughout the tower. His soldiers whirl, looking to identify the source of the commotion. Sir, Kazuki calls, leaning close at her computer screen, we have visual. Who is it? It's, Kazuki's blue skin pales. 
It's the Japanese military. And with them is Endeavor and All Might. Oh, fuck. NG scoffs, backhanding another so-called metal liberation soldier. He had been called out to deal with this rabble. Shouto could easily have handled a force this pathetic. Another group charges out from the central tower. Most of them fall to the soldiers' gunfire. Allegedly, the guns weren't lethal, some prototype being developed as riot equipment. In practice, these whelps were being used as live fire test dummies. He doesn't particularly care. He never saw the point of letting a villain live to strike again. Another way he did a better job than that blonde oaf beside him. But he stopped killing villains in fear of that down demon the people call Japan's guardian. Take care of the fodder, he barks to All Might. I'll push through and take Yansubashi. Endeavor, wait. The All Might bellows, but Inji ignores him. He runs ahead, breathing his right hand in flames. Once he's close enough to the approaching force, he slams his fist into the ground. Raging assault. Hell minefield. The ground erupts from underneath the metal liberation soldiers. He smirks, with no time to evade. The enemies fly backwards from the blast. His opening created, Enji rushes forward, slamming a burning fist against the occasional enemy. Soon, he finds himself at the base of the central tower. Standing just outside is his target, Yatsubashi Rikia. The CEO glares at Enji, but he refuses to be cowed by a mere insect. It's time I show that fool what a real hero looks like, Enji says, sliding into a battle stance. With your defeat, I begin the liberation of Japan. Yatsubashi strides forward, loosening his tie. Enji shifts his weight, concentrating the flames on his hand. Flash fire fist, jet burn. He punches forward, a burst of heat blasting forward and engulfing Yatsubashi. Enji keeps the fire going. Underestimating the leader of the revived Metal Liberation Army could get him killed. The seconds tick by, the roaring heat in front of him pressing his limits. Enji pants, forcing a super move so far immediately after using his hell minefield pushed him further than he'd expected. No matter, he'd already won. The flames flicker and die, and Inji grins, expecting to see the downed form of his opponent. Instead, he sees a monster, a black, hulking figure looking down his nose at him. 80% liberation. This is 80% of my stress made into physical power, endeavor. Isn't it glorious? This is my meta ability. The monster swipes an arm at Inji, and he barely pulls himself out of the way. Physical force isn't going to slow this thing down. He launches dozens of small fire blasts at the transformed Yatsubashi. The muscle-bound man winces and the fire burns through his clothes. But Inji can tell the man's quirk hasn't increased only his offense. Probably resists just about everything like that. Damn. Inji ignites his flames again. But before he can react, a wave of flashing black overwhelms him. Stress output burden. The wave smashes into Inji, launching him back. He slams into the ground and bounces, rolling further and further away. His careening body smashes straight through wall after wall. He tries to use his fire as propulsion to stop himself, but as out of control as he is, it takes his all just to slow down. Finally, he tumbles to a stop against a wall, deep inside some office building. Enji struggles, pushing himself to his feet, but his body refuses, and he collapses once more. The last thing he sees before fading to black is the rebar sticking through his side. It's been ten minutes since All Might and Endeavor arrived in Deka City backed by the Japanese military. There is still no word as to what led the military to call in hero reinforcements. But we have confirmed reports that over the past two days, Japanese military forces have launched raids on locations around Japan. On screen, about a dozen people rush out of the tower at the heart of Deka, followed by a dozen more, charging straight towards the heroes and soldiers. The newscaster tries to remain neutral as she watches the newcomers unleash their quirks against the joint forces, but when the soldiers return fire she breaks, and the soldiers are responding with, Oh, oh god. She trails off as the tower's defenders fall. Endeavor abandons his military escort and all might, charging through the crowd to where, isn't that the CEO of that lifestyle support company? The newswoman asks, Detonaret. Izuku growled, Endeavor's flash fire fist does absolutely nothing as the spindly suited man swells and grows with muscle. Izuku watches from the large screen in his study with a raised brow. So that's what it takes to beat you, Hanji. Izuku thought shaking his head. The attention seeker went after Yatsubashi and got himself humiliated. No wonder he was losing PR. Illogical arrogant fool. Izuku sighed in exasperation. You think Endeavor will pull through sir? Alfred asked and Izuku nodded. Without a doubt. He'll live and I'll get to put him behind bars. Izuku said nonchalantly and Alfred nodded handing him a cup of coffee he gratefully accepted. Tashinori smacks another goon into a wall. Eyeing him long enough to know he won't get back up. The ground rumbles. And he looks up in time to see a massive wave of black energy send Endeavor flying. From the corner of his eye. Tashinori sees the soldiers faltering behind him. There's a perfect pause, a moment of calm on the battlefield as everyone gawks. Then a cheer carries on the wind from the metal liberation forces. Friends and comrades, the crowd cheers again. 
and Tashinori knows the voice. It's been featured in commercials for years now. Yatsubashi, Tashinori snarls. Forward steps a giant, bound in dark muscle. Tashinori can barely recognize the man he is here to defeat. We are on the back foot now, yes. But now, your grand commander Redistro has taken to the field himself. Do not lose heart, for this is the era of the Metal Liberation Army. In the name of my father and his ideals, our true freedom is at hand. Not so, Tashinori roars. Your freedom comes at the price of millions of children around Japan. Discarded and destroyed because they have no value to your philosophy. Tashinori takes a step forward, bustling with energy. What would you know about that? Yatsubashi snarls. Have you not heard of Aldera, fiend? All Might calls. Yatsubashi's giant form stiffens. You claim to be for the freedom of quirks, and yet your followers allowed. No, encourage the abuse of innocent children because they weren't born to your standards. Your creed is nothing more than an excuse to further your own power. No child will ever be hurt that way again. The fact an entire chain of school districts neglected their duty of care in favor of this man fills Tashinori with incandescent rage. He takes another step, and the metal liberation soldiers step back. The tyranny of your so-called true freedom will never come to pass. Why? Tashinori launches himself forward, rearing back his fist as the goons between the two titans scramble out of the way. Because I am here. All Might roared in more rage than he ever felt in his life. Deep underground, a man with no eyes listens as his doctor watches the news. It's been a long time since one for all has fought against an organized front, he muses. It's almost nostalgic for the battles he waged against my allies in the years leading up to our duel. Maybe he'll take a blow to the other side, his doctor suggests. Symmetry and all that. All for one laughs at the imagery. Katsuki scoffed as he was watching the news with his future girlfriend in his house. Yes Futer because later he'll see how to steal this hot predatory bitch's heart but now he was focusing on the fight. So what if Long Nose has a bit of strength? Nerd doesn't have a damn quirk and he beat over hundred shitty extras in one night. All Might will win fucking guaranteed. Katsuki thought casually. Katsuki scowls. The reporter, the extras on the field, even his parents are acting like this is some big deal. But Himeko seems as bored and confident as he is. Another point for her. At least he will enjoy watching the villain getting smashed into next week. Hunch for punch, hit for hit, blow for blow, Yatsubashi is there. Their fists collide with every strike, shockwaves radiating from the two combatants. You would truly go so far for one quirkless? Yatsubashi howls over the clashing. Always, I'm sick of watching heroes like you be praised for your meta abilities when my army is ostracized for the same. Yatsubashi screams, his form increasing still. Stress, 100%. The man's blows come down harder and harder, and Tashinori puts everything he has into intercepting them. Each strike forces him back, his feet sinking through the street. The shock reverberates through his bones. Tashinori grits his teeth, smacking another punch away. Yatsubashi sneers, clutching both fists together and bringing them down on Tashinori's back. He coughs out spittle, barely blocking the follow-up hit to the chest. Tashinori flies back a good five meters, skidding against the ground. You called this stress, 100%, correct? Tashinori says. This is you at your strongest then. It is indeed. Behold, the full might of the Meta Liberation Army's Grand Commander. So that punch just now. Tashinori surreptitiously wipes the blood from his chin. That was the best you have. Tashinori glares, signature grin unwavering. Yatsubashi gawks, instinctively taking a step back. Seeing his moment, Tashinori charges once more, landing a clean hit into Yatsubashi's side. The Grand Commander howls but braces himself before he can be knocked back. Tashinori swings a left hook, but Yatsubashi is already moving to block it. Once more, they are matched blow for blow. Black energy swirls up from both of Yatsubashi's oversized fists, and Tashinori recognizes the attack that launched Endeavor. He's planning on ending this in the next hit. Stress output burden. Yatsubashi yells, swinging his arms forward in a wide arc, the black energy trailing. My opening, Texas smash. Tashinori surges a right hook straight into Yatsubashi's stomach. Wind roars out, through Yatsubashi and beyond into the Deka Central Tower. The twin black waves erupt out in a V-shape, leveling building after building. Skyscrapers fall like chopped trees, smoke, dust, and debris fog the streets. The silence is heard across Japan. Slowly, the breeze lifts the clouds of dirt. Yatsubashi Rikia is pressed into a crater in the wall of the Deka Central Tower. Slowly, he slips and falls to the ground, unconscious, and All Might is still standing. He raises a single fist and laughs, the sound echoing across Deka City. The soldiers raise their guns and cheer. The Metal Liberation forces, those that are still standing, that is, see their leader defeated and turn tail. Tashinori lets them. After all, there are only so many ways in and out of Deka. Their own defenses now trap them. Tashinori gives one last look at the ruins of Deka City, the grave of Destro's ideals. The Metal Liberation Army is no more. Chapter 26 The Press and Aftermath 
Summary All Might and Nedzu give a public statement. Green Shadow reminds the trash pile of his place and gives the abused family a new sense of safety. Chapter Text Press conferences and news releases are definitely Toshinori's least favorite parts of the job. His entire hero persona is based around the old adage, actions speak louder than words. He leaps around the city, defeats the villains, saves the people, retrieves the cat from the tree or what have you, and leads away again, all with his signature smile. His presence makes people feel safer. He's inspiring and hope-inducing. He is the symbol of peace. He is supposed to be out there, reassuring the public with just a passing glance of his trademark red, white, blue, and gold costume. Instead, he is sitting in a folding chair at a cloth-covered table, wearing a suit, waiting for the reporters to take their seats. Nedzu expertly announced before the media could begin wild speculation that All Might and himself would be discussing the Deka City battle of several hours ago at the UA Conference Center. He understands. The Deka City battle was the first time that heroes had officially worked alongside the Japanese military. The Heroics Public Safety Commission had made it very clear early in its inception that heroes were public servants, not soldiers. Technically, heroes couldn't even make arrests, merely detain villains for the police. For him, the number one hero, the symbol of peace, to stand side by side with a platoon of soldiers, it was bound to turn some heads. I will discuss the investigation into Alder and how we uncovered the connection between the so-called school district with the revived Metal Liberation Army, Nedzu says from the chair to his left. You focus on damage control for being involved in a military operation. Would you like any last-minute pointers? No thank you. Toshinori shakes his head. I have a pretty good idea already of what I want to say. He coughs blood into his hand. He's glad Nedzu reminded him that this was coming. He still has about 45 minutes left. But if the principal hadn't called him after the battle Toshinori is sure he would have used it pulling people out of the rubble. I will be sure to emphasize the uniqueness of this situation. Soon after, the microphones are on and the cameras are rolling. Nedzu pulls his mounted mic closer. As I have stated, this conference is to discuss the events broadcast earlier today. Specifically, the Japanese military employing All Might and Endeavor in a combat zone, as well as the nature of the threat they faced. Nedzu pauses. I believe, in this case, it makes the most sense to begin from the end. Yatsubashi Rikia, CEO of the Detneret Company, is in fact secretly the grand commander of a new metal liberation army. Predictably, the assembled members of the press explode, demanding answers. After a few seconds, Nedzu taps the mic, silencing them. As you are well aware, the original Metal Liberation Army, led by Destro, engaged the Japanese government in armed conflict before their ultimate defeat. As such, we could not treat the new MLA as a simple villain organization, and so we contacted the military. Toshinori sees his cue and takes it. As Nedzu said, Yatsubashi could not be treated as any ordinary villain. During our briefing, it was speculated that his forces numbered above 40,000 people. Toshinori lets that sink in. Personally, I am uncomfortable with heroes and military being deployed as though we are the same. I do not wish to see villains apprehended by soldiers any more than you. However, heroes alone could not face the threat presented by the new MLA alone, especially when we uncovered several pro-heroes had ties to their group. As such, the official statement of the HPSC is this, heroes can be employed in military operations as support only if it is known that an enemy combat would be classified as a villain were it not for their supporters, forces, or resources necessitating the involvement of the military. Heroes cannot be deployed beyond the borders of Japan in military operations, even if the above condition is met. I would like to add that the HPSC are aware of the precedent that could be set by allowing heroes into combat zones, and they assure me they will personally look over any future incident to determine whether hero involvement is necessary, Nedzu says. Nedzu talks some more about the legislation being drafted no doubt at that very moment to ensure the military would be unable to abuse hero involvement. Toshinori speaks more about the philosophy of using heroes in military operations. Eventually, they begin taking questions from the press. How did you discover Yatsubashi's connection to the MLA? One asks. Nedzu smiled put his paws together. There's someone watching over us, someone making sure that we are safe and hunting down any threat. We had help from the world's greatest detective himself. The room exploded into questions and Nedzu patted his microphone to silence everyone. He proved to be the most competent as he turned the investigation on a quirkiest school district such as Aldra to the discovery of a quirk supremacist cult in the form of a chain of school districts across the country. And by digging deeper he discovered the existence of the MLA and warned us about it. He did not just give us info on these terrorists but also pinpointed the indoctrination facilities on the form of schools across Japan and found the main base that is Deka City. All that in week proving how far he is willing to go for the citizens of Japan. Nedzu explained. So Green Shadow was involved. Was he really the one to uncover something this big? As expected of the world's greatest detective, was he in the battlefield? 
Did he participate in the raids on schools? All Might raised a hand and everyone quieted down. No, Green Shadow was not a part of the raids. He was not part of the fight. But yes he was the one to uncover this hidden threat that was hiding right under our noses. You see most people forget that Green Shadow is not a pro hero. Yes he is a hero in everything but name but he's not even a vigilante. He is a civilian. And as the symbol of peace I cannot allow him to get involved in military business. He already did enough and I am grateful for that. All Might said and everyone absorbed the information. The reporters explode once more. Toshinori silences them and explains that since his part of this conference is over, he will be leaving the rest to Nezu. He's running short on time for the day, which he knows Nezu knows. He also knows Nezu will find a way to get back at him for leaving him to answer the press alone. A cult school. A fucking cult school. Katsuki had been attending a cult school his entire life. The bastards. He knew his teachers were ass kissers, but he thought they all sucked up to him because they knew he was gonna be the best one day. Not because they wanted him to play second fiddle to their shitty cult leader. They never thought I could be the best. They wanted me as number two to that big-nosed fuck. Damn it. He restrains himself to small pops instead of the roaring blasts he wants to let out. His parents could afford to replace anything he burnt, but he didn't want them to scold him. You okay Bakun? Fangs asked across the table in the cafe they were in. Katsuki scowled. These fuckers just wanted me to be servant to their long-nosed leader. Katsuki yelled and Himiko sighed. Well we at least got the chance to see All Might punch that loser to Newt Week. Fangs cheered and Katsuki found himself agreeing. Yeah, and Izu got busy this past week huh? Katsuki asked and Fangs sighed. Yeah, he worked too hard this week. He needs to take a rest. Fangs said and Katsuki nodded. How about we all meet up at dinner? I'll get my parents, Auntie and Ko and Pinky then we have a nice night together. Katsuki offered and Fangs beamed. Genius, she exclaimed and they agreed. He smiled. After all, those cult bastards were right about one thing. Katsuki Bakugu was going to be the best. Such a shame, the doctor says, turning off the television. They had a rather sizable force we could have used, and they didn't even kill most of them. At least if they were dead, I could use their corpses as Naomu bases. Indeed, we have lost quite a powerful potential ally. All for one says. But fret not. Not all of Yatsubashi's forces were lost. They have gone to ground now. But if we are patient, I am sure they will come to us. Shigaraki is in need of quality supporters. Behind his respirator, all for one grins ear to ear. And besides, Endeavor was just humiliated live on national television. Perhaps if we are lucky, his wounded pride and ambition will drive him to further our goals on his own. That fight reminded me, Tashinori starts, that I need to be preparing a successor soon. Nenzu looks up from his tea. The two of them are alone in his office, some time after the conference ended. You struggled that much. He says, you hit it well. Tashinori sighed and nodded. Well I need to go somewhere first. Tashinori sighed and stood up. He needs to speak with the only family left of his master. And as much as he wanted to avoid that call Gran Torino. Rei Todoroki was confused. Around a year ago her husband pulled her out of the mental hospital and took her to his home. She terrified. What if he wanted another child? What if Shota wasn't enough for him? What did he want? He didn't speak or say anything the whole ride and it was unnerving. As they reached the property she went inside the house and she got dot dot an apology. Endeavor apologized to her. It was fake but he still apologized. It made no sense. Then she saw her children. They were older and she was happy to see them. But the guilt of what she did to Shoto was too much. They spoke about everything that happened. She was horrified over the training and abuse but confused to hear that Inji just stopped around a week ago and left them alone. After that the year went nicely. Endeavor rarely if ever raised his voice. She could spend time with her children and be happy. And after speaking with Shoto she convinced him that his fire was a part of him and should not hate it. She was happy but she still wondered who scared her husband into behaving. She wished to know to thank him. Ding ding. Ray went and opened the door just to almost stumble back. G Green Shadow. Ray asked, was she hallucinating? Did she have to go back to the hospital? Yes, I wanted to speak with you and your family before Endeavor comes, to ensure that he was behaving and being nice. Green Shadow said calmly, Oh, ooh well, of Kaos the world's greatest detective will find out about everything and she did. Well come in, Ray said as she took him to the living room. She called her kids who came quickly. Holy shit it's Green Shadow. Matsuo said in shock. W what are you doing here sir? Fayumi asked in shock. Are you here to finally drag my worthless excuse of a father to Tartarus where he belongs? Shoto asked bluntly and his family gaped at him. What? He obviously knows and I'll be happy to see Endeavor being thrown in jail. Shoto said casually. As much as that would warm my heart the country is still in chaos. If I expose him now it will be war. Green Shadow explained. The family nodded in understanding. Well how is he treating you lately? Green Shadow asked. Well I don't feel dead so much better. Shoto said and Izuku nodded but he was going to punch Endeavor later. Well we've been like a family so I'm happy, Fayumi said. 
Was she delusional or something to think they were just a normal family? Well that bastard is leaving us alone so great. Natsuo said and Izuku nodded. Well I'm grateful for you helping my family. Ray bowed and then the door was opened. Walking in with his side bandage was Enji Todoroki and Izuku smirked when the Batsard stumbled on seeing him. What are you doing in my house? Enji shouted. Making sure you're barking and biting your family obviously. Green Shadow said casually. Green Shadow got up. Thank you but I have to leave. Have a nice day. Izuku said then turned to Enji. And you better behave or I'll ruin you. Izuku said coldly. After he left Ray heard her husband rage in his office and smiled. She was safe from Endeavor, thanks to the Green Guardian of Japan. Chapter 27, Family Bounding Summary After the defeat of the Metal Liberation Army Izuku meets with Tashinori to speak about his grandmother then spends time with his family. Chapter Text Izuku sighed as he went to his study from the exit of the base. His talk with the Todoroki family put a smile on his face. The fact that this family was safe from that bastard made him happy. He'll make sure to keep Endeavor on a tight leash and never let it loose. After unsuiting he went to his desk and sit down. Izuku sighed feeling tired but happy. Now discrimination will be watched over very strictly and the police and schools will enforce the anti-discrimination laws. Izuku's phone vibrated and he looked to see it was just Yuraka. He got her phone number when he met her and they were speaking and texting. Machai, so did you watch the news? Smiling face. Deku, not really. Work and stuff. Neutral face. Machai, green shadow was the one to uncover the MLA. Grinning squinting face he's my favorite like 13. He's the coolest smiling face with sunglasses. Izuku blushed at her praise. Deku. Well he's a good detective so not surprised. Neutral face. Machai, good. He's the best. Deku. Possible I mean he caught a lot of pros. But how did you know it was him? Face with raised eyebrow. Machai. Well Nezu said he was the one to get the case. He's really amazing. Smiling face with hard eyes. Izuku's face became red. The girl was crushing on him. And didn't even know that. Deku. Well he's good at getting to the bottom of things and he's dealt with a lot of corruption so not surprised. Neutral face. Machai. Well to be fair he was around for around 4 years now. Thinking face ever wondered who he is. Deku. Nope. Slightly smiling face. Machai. Why? Face with raised eyebrow. Deku. If villains find out who he is his family will get hurt so we should keep his identity a secret not expose it. Zipper mouth face. Machai. Right. To stay the guardian of Japan he must stay unknown. Relieved face. Deku. Wait guardian, face with raised eyebrow. Machai, yes, he's officially now the guardian of Japan to the society. Smiling face with hard eyes. Deku, since your school was shut down and you graduated by default you'll start moving is that fine by you? Worried face. Machai, yes thank you for everything. Beaming face with smiling eyes. Deku, no problem we're friends after all. Slightly smiling face. After he was done texting your Raka Alfred came in and god bless him he was bringing coffee. Taking the cup of coffee Izuku sipped it gratefully. Thank you Alfred. Izuku said tired. A pleasure sir. But you might need to take a nap. You look a bit tired. Alfred advised. After the guests leave. Izuku nodded at the suggestion. Before Alfred could inquire the bell to the entrance of the property rang. Izuku looked through his computer to see two figures he expected. Hello. Izuku said to the familiar blonde skeleton and a short old man he knew. Izuku opened the gate for them and they came in. After a bit their car reached the manor and thankfully they were alone. Tashinori and Sorohiko entered Izuku's study and gaped at the huge room. Izuku sympathized with them. When Melissa showed him the room he almost fainted but he got used to it. Izuku stood up to greet his guests. Aoyagi-san and Sorohiko-san. Come and please and sit. Izuku motioned for the two chairs. The two sit down and looked at him quizzically. You're really rich. The old man said flatly. Izuku chuckled. Yes I'm. Thanks to Melissa's brain and my business talent one of the few things I got from my father we created our fortune. Izuku said smiling at them. So are you really a Shimura? Tashinori asked hopefully and Izuku nodded. Yes, my mother and Ko Shimura was given up to adoption as a baby. It sucks to know that all for one was after my grandmother. Izuku said gravely. The adults tensed. Young man how do you know that name? Tashinori asked seriously. Well I know about a lot of things. My grandmother, your injury, one for all and all for one as well as the fact that it's a quirk passed down. Izuku explained. That's a lot of knowledge boy. Sorohiko said and Izuku nodded. Knowledge is a powerful weapon. I like to stay as knowledgeable as possible. Izuku explained. Young man, why did you become a vigilante? Tashinori asked. Izuku chuckled. To help people. To be a person that criminals fear. To inspire those who think that not having a quirk makes them worthless in this world. Izuku explained. The older men looked at each other for a bit. Can you tell me about my grandmother? Izuku asked gently. After a pause they nodded. Tashinori smiled in a bittersweet way. She was a great woman. Tashinori started. She smiled through everything and inspired me. 
She took me as her successor and gave me one for all then she gave her life to fight all for one so I could escape with Gran Torino. All Might said feeling emotional. Izuku handed him a handkerchief. The older man gratefully accepted. Thank you and I'm sorry. I always get emotional when speaking about Nana. All Might said as he wiped some tears from his eyes. You don't have to apologize for being human. Izuku said softly as he gave a kind smile. Thank you, Tashinori said and Izuku nodded. How's your mother? Sorohiko asked with a smile after he wiped his own tears. Oh she is fine. She lives in the same house as before and is happy as a model. Izuku explained as he gave them a magazine and they nodded. Izuku decided to conveniently ignore Tashinori blushing on his mother. So from a brat with a taser to the world's greatest detective. The world really is weird like that. Sorohiko said amused. Yes but now that the MLA is gone I hope discrimination will cease. Izuku said sipping his coffee and the two drank the tea he offered them. So is it true? Sorohiko asked with a scowl. The mood instantly became serious. Is all for one really back? Tashinori asked with a growl. Yes, I am positive. Izuku said with a frown. We need to prepare and stay on guard. We don't know when he'll make a move but I'll try to get some info on him. Izuku said and they nodded. Well I guess we have to leave now. Tashinori said as he and Sorohiko stood up and Izuku shook his head. I insist you stay on dinner. They went to protest. Melissa will be sad if you don't see her. Izuku reminded and Tashinori deflated. Yes I miss Melissa. Tashinori said with a fond smile. And I want you to meet Himiko too. Izuku added. Who's that? Tashinori asked confused. Red Hood. Izuku answered simply. As Melissa entered the manor she was greeted by Alfred. Welcome home Lady Melissa. You have a guest to see. Alfred informed her. He is waiting in Master Izuku's study. So don't keep them waiting. He urged and she nodded. As she got to the study she knocked on the door. Izuku wouldn't mind if she just kicked the door like Himiko but she liked to respect him. She had the company on her name but he was the one making the deals and accountings. She heard a come in and she opened the door to see her Uncle Might speaking with Izuku about something. Uncle Might, Melissa exclaimed in happiness as she went to him. All Might went to his buff form and caught the girl who jumped and hugged him. He put her down and went back to his skinny form. Uncle Might, are you sure you're okay? Melissa asked and the older man nodded. Yes, and I see that you're growing up nicely. Great job my dear in your new job. Tashinori complimented and Melissa giggled. Thanks but it was Izuku's talent at business that got us this far. Even if he never admits it. Melissa said. Nonsense. It was you and your family name as well as your top quality support gear and items. Izuku said swiftly. See, he never takes credit for anything. Melissa pouted. Did you know that he never watched a Disney movie before last week? Melissa said. The hell. Ain't you sure you're human? Sorohiko asked in shock. Is it really a big deal? Izuku asked annoyed. Yes, they exclaimed. After that they met Himiko who came with a big smile on her face. You look in the best of moods Himiko. Izuku said casually as the five sit in the dining table. Himiko grinned. Yes it was a very good day. I got to hang out with Bakun and met his parents. Auntie Mitsuki likes me and wants me to model for her. Himiko cheered and Izuku patted her on the head. Good for you kitten. You have the looks of one. Melissa smiled. Yes, you are very beautiful so make the best of it. Izuku said bluntly. So you're all might. I knew from Bunny that you were injured but I'm sorry it was that bad. Himiko said sadly. She shivered as she remembered the wound on his chest. It's okay young lady. Tashinori assured her with a smile. Well this amazing. You eat this every day. Sorohiko asked and Himiko beamed. Yup, Alfred is the best cook ever. Himiko cheered. So did you pick a successor yet? Himiko asked casually. Tashinori puked blood. Does everyone know about one for all? He exclaimed. Only Bunny family. Melissa winked. Is that what we're calling us now? Izuku asked. Yes. Both girls chirped and Izuku shrugged. Izuku's family wasn't perfect or traditional but he loved it. And now he got a sheepish uncle and a funny grandfather. Life was great. Chapter 28. A trip to the mall. Summary. Izuku takes his sisters to the mall like any man of the house would and Katsuki tags along. Chapter text. Predictably. The announcement that not only had the Meta Liberation Army revived, but that All Might and Endeavor had worked alongside the Japanese military took the internet by storm. The Aldera scandal went from a localized Mustafu event to international news overnight. On social media, debates over the legality and justice of the joint hero, military raid run rampant. Talk shows call in experts to discuss the Hero Public Safety Commission's public statement regarding the use of heroes in armed conflict. Online essays, video or otherwise, sprout like weeds and quickly begin referencing or countering other essays. The Ministry of Education quickly announced they would be going through every school in Japan with a fine-tooth comb. What Izuku hadn't expected was the communities of people with weak or stereotypically villainous quirks to emerge online praising the complete collapse of the Metal Liberation Army. Izuku even sees some posts from people who listed themselves as quirkless on their profiles. 
They're all talking about throwing an actual massive party celebrating the MLAS defeat, only a few days after the brawl between All Might and the leader of the army. And hashtag MLIs over party leads the trending section of every major social media site. Invisibitch, yes. Fuck that black Pinocchio. 5. 0k likes. Alien Queen, fuck that damn cult. God bless Green Shadow. 7. 0k likes. Rockstar, yeah thumbs up. God bless that green bundle of horroism. 9. 0k likes. Riot in red. Well did everyone forget how Induor was shot across two streets. LMFAO at the burning trash rolling on the floor laughing grinning squinting face. 10. 0k likes. Pikachu. Well that was an excellent Induor bashing bitches. Curse the burning trash. 8. 0k likes. Vampire Queen. Well I'm throwing a party in my family manor. Hashtag MLIs over party. 15. 0k likes. Frog Girl. Well I'll sure be there. Happy MLA bashing day everyone. 12. 0k likes. Mad scientist. Ha 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 ha. Yes. Hashtag MLIs over party. 5. 0k likes. And so it went. Some digging shows that other cities have similar impromptu celebrations planned online. Izuku knows Kakin won't be caught dead somewhere where the kinds of people he calls extras are hanging out, unless Himiko gets him to come somehow. But it'll be great. Yes he'll let Himiko throw a party. As long as his study is shut down and the entrance to the base is locked then no problem. Izuku was also interested in maybe seeing kids his age attending. He wasn't a social butterfly but he'll need some friends and hey Hamilo does too so it's hitting two birds with one stone. The party is a week from now. I need to relax until then or Melissa and mom will tie me up to the bed. Izuku grumbled to himself. Izuku sighed in exasperation as he laid in his bed feeling tired. It was a hectic time with anarchy and the MLA. Then the whole mess with the Baujimin are all for one. The man is alive and plotting with the instant villain's nonsense. He stopped after a bit of Izuku's investigation and he was confused. Did the Yakuza stop supplying him? He'll have to deal with the Yakuza after he takes some rest. Maybe dig into this overhaul guy he kept hearing about since the rumors weren't very pleasant. But who believes the rumors? He's just a drug dealer not some type of inhuman monster. And if he is, well Izuku needs someone to practice his bone-breaking moves on. In the Shai Hisekai base Kai Chizaki felt impending doom nearing him for some reason. Why do I hear boss music? Overhaul inquired as he was doing some experiments. Come on buddy. Come on. Hurry. Himiko whined and Izuku sighed. Coming. I was just fixing myself. Izuku said. He'd rather sleep more but he promised his sister that he would take her to the mall. The Kiyashi Mall was the biggest and most filled bank in the prefecture and he promised to take her buy some stuff for her room and clothes. Melissa decided to tag along and get her own stuff. Wow Izu you look great, Melissa said with joy at his new looks. Izuku was wearing a dark lather jacket with jeans, black boots and a necklace with a jewel on it. His bushy black and green hair was cut until it was more like locks of hair. And he dyed his hair to be fully green. He wanted to change his looks with the new life he started. Damn it nerd you look fucking great, Katsuki said. So do we go? Himiko asked about to go to the limousine but Izuku stopped her. Not with that car, Izuku said and Melissa grinned. I'll drive my new car, Izuku stated. What car nerd? Is it a cool one? Katsuki asked. Izuku went to a car with covers and uncovered it revealing a Ferrari car. Katsuki and Himiko's eyes became the size odd dinner plates. A fucking Ferrari. The not couple exclaimed in shock and joy. Izuku took the driver's seat and started the engine grinning all the while. Shotgun. Himiko and Katsuki said then glared at each other. Melissa swiftly took the front seat and the two ended up in the back. Izuku started driving and the blondes cheered in joy. The ride to the mall was fun and Izuku enjoyed driving the car. Of course some officers stopped him on the way but after he he showed his driving license they let him go and they kept on their way to the Kiyashi Mall. Himiko looks around, starstruck. She'd been to malls before, of course. Hanging out with friends in the mall was normal. But she'd never really been for herself. She doesn't remember the last time she bought something at the mall either, except when she needed it to be normal. So even with Izuku claiming the ride to the mall isn't much, Himiko still finds herself blown away. We're starting with clothes. Get yourself some summer clothes, dear. Melissa said and Himiko nodded. Man I'm in need for a new boxing gloves. I'm going to a tournament and need the best of the best. Katsuki declared. Everyone started to pity the poor souls that will face this Pomeranian. There are so many options. Everywhere Himiko looks, racks of clothes stand in neat rows and the shelves cover the walls. Mannequins pose with full outfits on them. Each sorted by age, sex, and quirk demographics. Himiko bounces around flighting between different racks like a bee looking at flowers. What do you think, big bro? Emiko holds up a neon green short crop shirt. Think I could rock this. Izuku laughs. Kinda. Katsuki she rugged and Melissa smiled. Nah, a high, dry voice sounds behind her and Himiko jumps. She turns to see a girl about their age. 
wearing some band t-shirt over a skirt and leggings. You'd be great in pastel goth, though. Emiko giggles. Maybe. I'm not really sure what I want to wear yet. Emiko said exclaimed. Well, not that, the girl says. A cord from her ear gesturing at the shirt Himiko grabbed. Oh, that's so cool. Izuku is beside the new girl in a flash. How strong are they? What happen if they get cut? Do they help you hear better? Oh, they have jacks on the end. Can you plug them into electronics? Ah, uh, the new girl says. Himiko snorts and Katsuki chuckled while Melissa smiles. He's a quirk enthusiast. It's fun to watch when you're not the one he's examining. Himiko said and Izuku takes a step back giving a quick apology. His nerding was always a character glitch he couldn't fix. It's fine, I just wasn't expecting it. Kayo Kajiru. The girl introduced herself. I'm Deku Shimura. Izuku says with a smile. His hands in his pockets. Himiko Yoga. Call me Himiko. Himiko said grinning. Katsuki Bakugu. He grunted. Melissa Shield. Melissa waved. Wait. Deku Shimura. Melissa Shield. Holy shit you're the rich teens. Jeru said in disbelief. The two geniuses looked at each other for a few seconds before shrugging. Not that rich Izuku said. You have a fucking Ferrari. Katsuki said flatly and the Jiru gaped. What the flying fuck? She whispered then shook her head. So, Himiko, trying out a new style. Something like that, she says. I wasn't really allowed to choose my own before. Jiru nods, eyes soft. That sucks. Glad you're getting to do it now. Let's see. Jiru walks around Himiko, studying her carefully. Huh. Dark colors would work on you. Got any preferences? Red. Himiko says. Jiru looks up in thought. I think I got an idea. Jiru leads them around the aisles, grabbing a handful of deep red shirts. Occasionally, she stops and grabs a dark blue or black overshirt or jacket and adds them to the cart Izuku and Katsuki helpfully grabbed and drag. Jiru finishes their run with some dark gray skirts and black pants. Try one of these on, Jiru says. And Himiko wastes no time grabbing an outfit from the cart and dashing into the changing room. She switches into a red dress shirt, which she tucks into a dark skirt and pants combo before putting a deep blue jacket over the whole thing. She steps out of the changing room and does a quick twirl for her audience of four. You look great, kitten. Melissa complimented. Kinda hot. Katsuki mumbled and Izuku patted her on the head. You look good little kitten, he said and she cheered. Not bad, Jiro says. You were right about red being your color. You going to that manor party on the 31st? If you are, you better wear something good, Jiru said in the fur laugh. What's funny? Jiru asked with a raised brow. We're throwing the party. Emiko said and Melissa nodded. Are you for a family? Jiru asked. Nah, they are, I'm his childhood friend. Katsuki said motioning to Izuku. Eventually, Himiko had all the clothes she wanted. She and her family say their goodbyes to Jiro and move on to the next stop, room decorations. Finding decorations that she likes is much easier than clothes shopping. While there are some cute animal posters, Himiko finds herself pulled towards some particularly striking artwork. Vivid images of gothic locations and people. According to the tag, the artist is local. Himiko takes five. For her desk, she finds an electronic clock and a small fan. She picks out a nice collection of sheets and blankets. Izuku can't even tease her for only picking red bedding because she grabbed other colors and patterns this time. When she points this out to him, he silently gestures to the bags of clothes with a deadpan expression. With her decorations sorted, Himiko and her family check out, carrying all the bags with them to the car back to the manor. They dropped Katsuki on the way and his is home before going back to Shield Manor. Despite Himiko's protests, her family insist on helping her set up. Neither of them place any of her posters. Melissa just folds her clothes while Izuku folds the sheet. They even ask where she'd like them in the closet. By the time Himiko's room is her room, the sun has long set. Izuku and Melissa grinned at her at dinner and even wished her a good night. She had a great day. Chapter 29 A Bond Between the Discriminated Summary With the Metal Liberation Army gone, many people around Japan who face discrimination from their ideology come together to celebrate. Chapter Text The remaining days until the party flew by quickly. Izuku got to spend some time with his siblings and even invited the rest of his family for the first time. Yes he always went to visit his mother and godparents but now he actually got to have them come. Dong Dong And here they are. He got up from his chair and put his documents in their place before exiting the study and going to greet his family. The Bakugas gaped at the huge manor and Nko was on the verge of fainting. This manor was huge. A typical rich businessman huge. Katsuki didn't seem phased probably because he came over a few times. Holy shit is Uchan lives here? Mitsuki asked in disbelief. I think I'm going to pass out honey. Masaru said stunned by the place's size. Oh dear, my baby made a crushing success with Shield San. He's living in a literal castle. Inko said in awe. Katsuki scoffed. You'd get used to it after a while. He said nonchalantly. Welcome everyone. Master Izuku is waiting for you. Alfred said as he came to them. Holy shit he even has a butler. 
Mitsuki mumbled and Katsuki rolled his eyes. His old hag was a simp for money. Thank you we'll wait. And Ko said. Hello. Himeko came down from the big stairs and greeted everyone. Nice to see you all. Himeko said cheerfully. Hey there kitten. Where's Izu? Mitsuki asked. Probably doing something that will make him more rich than he already is. Himeko shrugged. Well he is the reason my company is so successful. Melissa said as she came. Hello there Shield San. And Ko greeted. Please call me Melissa. I'm American so I prefer that. Melissa said. Izuku seems to be busy lately. Hope he's alright. Masaru sighed and Melissa huffed. Yeah, that green bundle of stress needs to relax or he'll burn himself out. Melissa shook her head. Well he seems to be doing well if this huge mansion is anything to go by. Mitsuki said. Well hello ma'am you must be Auntie Inko. I'm Himiko. Himiko said as she moved closer to Inko who smiled warmly. Well hello Himiko. I'm Inko Shimura. Inko said kindly. Hey everyone. Hopefully I'm not late. Izuku said as he came down from his office. Well you look fucking great Izu-chan. Mitsuki grinned. Holy shit you look like a different person. The woman exclaimed with a laugh. Izuku and Inko hugged each other and they all went to one of the living rooms. They all sit on the couches while Katsuki and Izuku sit in the sofa across a huge TV. They started a game of hero combat and picked their characters. Izuku picked a racer head while Katsuki picked All Might. You're gonna lose nerd. Katsuki exclaimed. You say that but you never beat in Super Smash Bros even once. Izuku said flatly. And as you'd expect Izuku kept winning. After many many one-sided games Katsuki gave up and settled on throwing a fit. After that they went for dinner. Why do you need this huge table? Mitsuki asked in shock. Well we needed a big table in case we had a dinner meeting. Melissa explained. Wait that's a thing. Masaru seemed surprised. Who knows? And Ko said amused. So what's gonna happen with school now? Mitsuki asked. I'm sending Himiko to the Musutafu General School District. Izuku explained. It's safer and way less bullies and maybe she'll find some friends. Izuku said. Well what were you doing before you came to greet us? Inko asked curious. I'm going to build a bunch of apartment complexes across the city and I was looking through the plans. Izuku said. Is that why you hired a whole construction company? Masaru asked surprised. Yes but they're not as big as you'd think. Izuku said and Alfred at that time brought them the food. The smell was amazing and the taste was even better. As they ate they kept speaking. So how did you end up uncovering a fucking cult hidden from sight? Mitsuki asked. Izuku just shrugged. Well I started an investigation on Alder and I was confused by their legal teams being as good as they were so I researched and found the Detranic company being the sponsor then I traced the payments to other schools in the prefecture then when I researched the Detranic company I discovered that they were nothing but a damn cult terrorist organization. So I present the case to Principal Nenzu and helped search the other prefectures around the country then I traced Daka City being the base of their operations then I trusted All Might to finish the job. Izuku explained in detail and the adults were stunned. Holy shit dot dot you really are the Mitsuki said but was cut off. The world's greatest detective I get that a lot. Izuku said exasperated. Well you uncovered a fucking cult rotting this country so you are. Katsuki snapped and Izuku sighed in defeat. After that the rest of the days until the party flew by quickly. Izuku and Melissa hired some cooks and servants for the event, a DJ and bought some necessities for the party. The party started from sunset and they decided to have it in the yard since it was big enough to house the whole attenders. Izuku was leaning on the wall of the manor and watching people interacting with each other. He noticed Melissa speaking to a bunch he recognized from the sports festival and decided to greet them. He walked to them and Melissa's face lit up. Hey Deku, come here and meet my friends. Izuku nodded and came closer to see three kids from class 1A. Hello I'm Deku Shimura and it's nice to meet you. Izuku bowed politely. Hello, my name is Mirio Tagata. Nice to meet you green buddy. Mirio said enthusiastically as they shook hands. Wow you're strong for a 14 year old. Mirio exclaimed and Izuku smiled. So are you. Izuku replied. Hey, I'm Nejire Hadu. I like a lot of things. Are you Melissa Chan's brother? Boyfriend? Oh what's your quirk? Are you her partner? Izuku raised his hand and stopped talking for a second. Well to start we're like siblings, second I'm quirkless, third yes I'm her business partner. Izuku answered and Mirio looked surprised. Wow I'm usually the only one to keep up with Nejire Chan. You're quick to listen. We Mirio complimented and Izuku shrugged. And this is Tamaki Amajiki. Melissa grabbed the shy boy who was a blushing mess. He's very shy but sweet too. Melissa said and Izuku smiled at the trio his sister befriended. After that he went to see a redhead arm wrestling a bird made of shadow and looked intrigued. He looked to see that the redhead reminded him of Crimson Riot. Hey, you a fan of Crimson Riot? Izuku called out and the kid's head snapped to him. In a speed so great Izuku's well-trained eyes barely registered the boy was in front of him. Hell yeah dude, he's one of the manliest heroes ever. The boy grinned. Ajoro Kirishima. The boy exclaimed. Izuku shook his hand. Deku Shimura. Izuku said with a smile. 
The boy with the bird head, who Izuku can now see is connected to the shadow creature, shuffles awkwardly. Takoyami Fumikage, the boy nods toward the shadow creature. My fellow servant of darkness here is Dark Shadow. Nice to meet ya, Dark Shadow says. Izuku introduces himself in turn. So, you're a sapient quirk. That's pretty rare. Izuku starts. Did you manifest at his birth or when he was four? Can you read his mind? Ew. Can you talk telepathically? Takoyami blinks several times. Dark Shadow suddenly flies forward, wrapping around Izuku and hugging him, while Takoyami looks away sheepishly. Few people treat Dark Shadow as their own person, he admits. They tend to get excited about it. Kirishima laughs. Yeah he did that with me too. The redhead said cheerfully. Izuku smiles. It's okay. As a quirk scientist I assure you that you are your very own person. Izuku said patting the shadow bird who beamed. You're a quirk scientist. Takoyami asked surprised and then he realized. Wait you're that Shimura guy. I saw you in a magazine around a year ago. He said and Izuku smiled. Yes that's me. Izuku said cheerfully still patting dark shadow. Wait that means you own this place? Kirishima's eyes were wide open. You must be rich. Kirishima laughed. He has a fucking Ferrari. Izuku looked to see Jiru walking to them with an excited pink-haired and skinned girl. Hey Ashido this is. Kirishima trailed off realizing what Jiru said. Shit. You have a Ferrari. It's the manliest car in history. Only a real man drives a Ferrari. Izuku declared and Kirishima wiped a tear obviously touched. Damn straight nerd. Katsuki said walking to them with Himiko. The pink girl introduced herself. Hey, I'm Mina Ashido. Nice to meet you all. She said happily. They chatted a little until it turns out that everyone wants to be heroes. Well if you're all going to UA you should use this year to prepare. Izuku said. Well obviously, I'll be the next number one hero. More badass than All Might himself. Katsuki declared and Himiko nudged him. Yes, I want to be a hero to save people and stand up to bullies. Mina declared. I intend to use my power of the dark to serve the light. Takoyami said. Well I want to help those with villainous quirks realize that it's not a bad thing. Emeko cheered. Well I want to follow my idol Crimson Riot and be a hero with his philosophy. Kirishima cheered. Well you all can come and use the quirk gym in my manner. Emeko could use some partners. Izuku smiled and his new friends cheered. The rest of the party was great and everyone had fun and Izuku made a good list of new friends for Himiko so all in all it was a good night. Chapter 30 Iri Summary Izuku finds a harm child but turns out it's more disastrous than he thought. He'll enjoy taking down that damn Yakuza. Chapter Text Enji Todoroki sat in the middle of his destroyed home gymnasium. The cost of replacing his equipment was of little consequence to him, and the soundproofing he had installed meant that he would not bother his children or wife with the noise as he worked out his aggression. Once he had, he was deep in thought, and his thoughts weren't pleasant. That down green shadow had him on a tight leash. He showed up in his home. He talked with his family and made it clear that if he even raised his voice he'll be dragged out to jail. Shit the file that Rabbit gave him is a copy of what he has scared the shit out of him. Everything illegal and immoral he ever did. He abused the quirk marriage even the tax evasion and he close on having this burning him out. No pun intended. So he must think of a way to escape the demon's clutches but how? The kid could literally throw to the wolves, give everything he owns to Ray and the kids then throw him in jail. He was also dealing with the public humiliation from his fight with Redistro. People were mocking him. Him, the number two hero. And the worst thing is that the green rabbit became as popular as All Might. The kid obviously was trying the opposite. And now he was officially Japan's guardian. What happened to the world? And he sighed as he looked at the destruction he made. He was still furious but now he shouldn't worry of losing his cool around his family. But were they really his family? Ray was terrified of him and god damn it she had good reasons. Natsuo would throw a party if he died and Shoto would get him thrown in Tartarus if he could. Fayumi was the only one to see him as her father and it's because the girl was delusional about their family being normal. They weren't normal. They were broken and he was the reason. Dad, are you feeling better? Fayumi asked worried. God how the hell could she care? Fine, go to your room or spend time with your mom and siblings. I'm still in need to exercise. Then she sighed and she nodded hesitantly. Thought he was pathetic. If Taoya saw him now he would cackle at his misery. He just will have to keep his distance and not give them more reasons to hate him. He can do that. After all he just has to not be a bastard. It shouldn't be hard. Green Shadow was the bane of his existence but the rest of the Todoroki family would think otherwise. Izuku sighed as he finished some paperwork in a local travel agency he just bought. Yes he bought a damn traveling agency, sue him. He just finished the paperwork that took forever to complete and exit it. It was a couple weeks since the party and he got a good number of friends as well as Himiko. And speaking of friends they just texted him. Alien Queen, hey guys, how's it going? Beaming face with smiling eyes. Riot in red, great. I finished some manly workout with Bekubro. Flexed biceps light skin tone. Bomb, we met in the fucking gym. 
Turns we go to the same damn place but in different times. Unamused face. Vampire queen. Well I did a nice photo shoot with your mom Bakun. I look hot in the pictures. Face blowing a kiss. Machai. Well I've been training in that old Tekoba beach since there's a lot of stuff to use my quirk on. Grinning face with smiling eyes. Deku. Well I just finished some paperwork and I'm going to my car. Neutral face. Riot in red. Still can't believe you have a car and can drive dude. That's manly. Smiling face with sunglasses. Rockstar. Yeah you single. Smirking face. Alien queen. Not sure he's probably taken smirking face. Deku. Not really but I'm too boring for you neutral face. Machai. Mood. Rockstar. Mood. Bomb. Mood. Riot in red. Mood. Vampire queen. Mood. Alien queen. Mood. Deku. Just saying that I'm not a very fun person and I suck at comedy. Vampire queen. Bullshit. You're the one who wrote that essay on Endeavor a couple years ago. Rolling on the floor laughing. Everyone, what? Exploding head exploding head exploding head. Izuku stopped as he noticed someone running in his direction and about to collide with his leg. He prepared himself as a girl ran out of the alleyway and collided with him. He was surprised to the point he didn't catch her. A young girl took a fall after hitting him. She had long white hair, red eyes, and a horn like a unicorn's on the right side of her forehead. She was barefoot, wearing a tattered dress, and her arms and legs were bandaged. Oh, I'm sorry, did I hurt you? Izuku asked the small girl, crouching down to her level. She didn't look hurt, but she did look terrified. His thoughts trailed off as a man in his thirties appeared in the alleyway the girl ran from. He was dressed in a black dress shirt and slacks with a grey tie, a green jacket with a purple feather ruff, and white gloves. His most notable feature was the red and gold plague doctor mask worn around his nose and mouth. Izuku's instincts that he honed to feel danger flared to life as the man appeared. This guy was dangerous and this girl was obviously terrified of him. Eri, the man's voice came out, let's go back. No need to bother the nice boy, now. He said, as he said that Izuku pulled the taser gun he keeps in his arm and hid it in his sleeve. He pressed a button on his watch to allergy Alfred of his location and call the cops. I apologize on my daughter's behalf, young hero, the man said. She's a bit of a troublemaker. She likes to play games, and sometimes she gets hurt. This girl looked petrified. Izuku didn't need to be a genius to see that, and his excuse was pathetic. It's no problem at all, sir. I'm always happy to help anyone in need, Izuku said with a smile. I should be the ones apologizing. However, there's been a rash of kidnappings lately. He wouldn't mind coming to the police station with me to confirm that she's your daughter, would you? Izuku asked and the man scowled. I'm afraid that I'm a very busy man, the bird-masked man said. I need to take my daughter back right this minute. His tone was still pleasant, but insistent. Please, please don't go. The girl clung to Izuku's shirt. I'm afraid that protocol requires that I check in with the police to verify your claims. Izuku said, equally pleasant, but insistent. He wasn't letting this girl go. It happened in an instant. The man began to remove one of his gloves. The girl gasped in shock. And Izuku, his body moved on its own. He jumped, grabbed his taser and screamed. What in the world? It's green shadow. The man turned in shock and Izuku used that. He aimed and fired at the man tasering him. He twitched and fell to the ground. You filthy, diseased child. That cursed wretch holds the cure to your sickness yet you reject my efforts to return you to purity. The man screamed but Izuku ignored him. Izuku never let go of the button until the man was out cold. His eyes were cold as he walked to the man and put quirk suppression cuffs on his hands. Izuku looked at the girl he was holding with his left arm. She looked at with shock, relief and a lot of joy. What the hell did he do to her? Izuku looked at the girl and gave the warmest smile he could. Hey there. He said your name was Iri. Is that right? The girl, Iri, gave a quick nod. Don't worry, he won't be able to hurt you anymore. Izuku said giving the unconscious bastard a kick to the face for his own satisfaction. Who's this guy Eric? Izuku asked gently. Over hull. Eric whispered and Izuku gave a blank look. Well, shit. Of course, that was the point that several police cars came blaring forward, with many pro heroes coming along. Izuku sighed as he sank into a chair at the police station. His questioning was over. Turns out that knowing a police captain that can verify lies speeds up a lot of things. Izuku was worried for the girl when his phone vibrated. Bomb, nerd. You okay? Fearful face. Deku, yeah. Normal stuff. Neutral face. Riot in red. What normal? Face with raised eyebrow. Deku, an abused traumatized girl collided with me. Her father came to take her. I tasered him. Turns out he's a Yakuza boss and not her dad. I'm in a police station. Neutral face. Rockstar. Machai. Alien queen. Vampire queen. We should check you for a trouble magnet quirk. Unamused face. Deku. Good idea. Anyway gotta check the girl so bye. Izuku put his phone in his pocket and went to Naomasa. How's she? Izuku asked. She has obviously been traumatized and abused. There's no official record of her existence, so her birth was likely kept secret, Naomasa said. 
They're trying to assess her medically, but it appears that any attempt to do so frightens her, and she's asking to see the nice boy. He added, yeah that's me. Izuku sighed. You do fit the description of the green nice boy with a taser and a warm smile. Nayamasa said with a chuckle, can I see her? Izuku asked. Of course, Nayamasa replied, leading him towards the room she was in. The second the girl saw him she jumped from her chair and ran to him. Izuku was prepared this time and picked her up. She hugged him tightly and buried her face in his white button-up shirt. He was wearing his normal suit. Hey there Uri, did you behave well? Izuku asked gently and she nodded stiffly. So what now? Izuku asked Nayamasa who shrugged. No idea, she has no family and we sure as hell not giving her back to overhaul. Nayamasa frowned. We should find her a place but first we need the whole story. He stated, Izuku sit in one of the chairs. He wrapped his arms around the little unicorn and stroked her hair gently. Eri we need the whole truth. I will be here to protect you. I promise little girl. So tell me everything so I can put overhaul away. Izuku cooed at the child. There was a short pause. Do you promise to believe me? Eric asked her five still in his shirt. Izuku nodded with confidence. And so she told them everything from her quirk, to overhaul's treatment, to the things he called her and the experiments and everything he ever did. When Eri was done, Izuku was both sick and furious. He knew what to do. This child was alone in this world with no one to care for her. He will protect her no matter what. Nayamasa bring me the paperwork. I'm adopting her. Izuku said bluntly. Nayamasa gaped. Are you sure? He asked and Izuku nodded. Paperwork this time was bigger and harder. But it was well damn worth it. Izuku was driving his car back home until he called Melissa. Izuku, are you okay? Melissa asked worried. Yes, listen there's something I need to tell you. Izuku said. What is it? Melissa asked. I adopted a girl. Izuku answered bluntly. There is a pause. Explain when you come back. I'm not gonna complain to have a little girl in the manor. Melissa said. How old is she? Melissa asked. Four to five. We don't know her birth date. Izuku answered. Listen can you and Alfred get clothes and other things? Izuku asked. Sure. Send me a picture. Melissa chirped and Izuku sent a picture of Iri in a white shirt and a red dress he bought her. Melissa gasped. Oh my god she's so precious. I'll spoil her rotten. Melissa declared and Izuku chuckled. Good. See you in a bit. Izuku ended the call and looked at Iri. How's the candy apple? Izuku asked with a smile. The girl beamed, her eyes shining. It's amazing, sir, Iri said with joy. Well call me dad and you'll get more when we go home. Izuku said as he patted her head. Home, Iri asked and Izuku nodded. Yes, from now on you live with me and my sisters. You'll be safe and happy I promise. Izuku assured his daughter and she nodded. He was a father now. Him, Katsuki will burst in laughter when he hears. And God his mom will flood the manor when she meets Iri. But it will be worth it. And he'll destroy the shy Hisekai. With his own hands. But for now he'll focus on his daughter. Chapter 31 Home and Family Summary Iri meets her new family and Izuku tries to give her all the care she deserves. Chapter Text All for One grinned as one of his gambits was coming to fruition. As with any villainous mastermind, All for One had plants within numerous police forces. His services were still in high demand. Even now that the world was swimming in powerful quirks, the officer in question was once a boy who had a quirk labeled as villainous. His parents had proposed a trade, giving all for one that quirk in exchange for one fit for the family of police officers. The boy no longer caused horrifying waking nightmares on those he touched. Instead, he now only slept an hour each day. He followed in his father's footsteps, and every so often, he spoke on the phone to the family friend who unlocked the potential of his quirko so long ago. It was enough to keep him familiar with the officer. Familiar enough that he could, if he so chose, transported the man or anyone close to him to his location using one of his quirks. And the officer in question was currently guarding Kai Chisaki as he was being transferred to Tartarus. All for one exhaled, hating how the warping quirk interacted with his respiratory system. The helmet, at the very least, kept the coughing to a minimum. He was prepared for this meeting, after all. He had to dress his best to welcome the man to his base. As the Yakuza boss materialized in front of him, he saw that the young man's restraints were gone. The man was retching, horrified by the awful taste of the slime that brought him there. Ah, young Chisaki, came all for one's mechanically deep voice. A pleasure to meet you. You, the disgust on Chisaki's face was palpable, more than it was at the foul liquid covering him. The legendary plague rat, the typhoid Mary of the New Age. Ah, yes, I'd heard the rumors of your eccentricities. All for one stated, the belief that quirks are a disease, and that you were attempting to find a cure. I have good news for you. Then, young man, he smiled beneath his helmet. I am here to relieve you of your own illness. No, I must endure, Chisaki panicked. I must continue my work. You can't. I don't recall asking you for permission. All for one stated, your concept of a means to erase quirks is admittedly intriguing. 
but I already possess the ability to deprive someone of a quirk. Allowing you to develop your own method is, unfortunately, a threat that I cannot abide. It's a pity. You could have made an excellent lieutenant if not for your proclivities. Two black rivets, cracked with glowing red lines, emerged from All for One's back, stabbing Chisaki through the wrist as he cried out in pain. All for One approached him, placing both hands on the younger man's throat. Don't worry, young Chisaki. Your quirk will serve me well. Red energy poured into All for One from the holes on his hands as the quirk began to transfer. He could feel it pour into his veins. And then, all of a sudden, his hands were racked with pain. Despite the pain of being pierced, Chisaki managed to tear his own arms through the rivets that All for One produced, bringing his hands to All for One's wrists and activating his quirk one last time. Once his quirk was gone, All for One, enraged, grew more rivets, grabbed Chisaki's head with them, and forced his face into a nearby toilet. He ignored the drowning Yakuza's death throes as he examined the damage. This wasn't the first time someone used a quirk on him mid-transfer, but this was the most ruinous of those occasions. Chisaki had only limited control of his quirk mid-transfer, and thus could not have killed all for one nor prevented the transfer itself. But he could easily make this new addition to his collection a Pyrrhic victory. All for one's hands were now horrendously deformed, as if they had been clenched into fists and burned so thoroughly that they melted together like plastic and covered with odd bony growths across them. The holes through which he used his primary quirk were still present. Using the quirk mid-transfer prevented that from changing. All for one felt overhaul within him, and he clapped his deformed hands together to use the quirk. Failure. He tried pressing his hands across his face, his body, anywhere to attempt to restructure his own body, which he knew the quirk was capable of doing. Failure. Realizing these hands couldn't use his new quirk, all for one grew some new rivets from his back. He used these to slice off the new hands and let his copy of Super Regeneration regrow them. To his horror, the hands grew back in the same deformed state, growling in frustration. All for one returned to his bed, using the rivets to reconnect himself to his life support. He had quirks that could overcome this new disability. Ultimately, this would be a minor inconvenience. A brief setback. One failed plan out of many. And now, at least overhaul was in his arsenal. Though, with such power over him, could he truly trust anyone with this weapon? Eri stared in awe at the manor in front of her. Unlike where Overhaul lived, this house seemed dot dot safe. It gave her a warm feeling like she was welcome and wanted. This is your new home Eri Chan. Izuku said as he picked the little girl in his arms and walked to the manor. He opened the door and smiled as he put her down. This is your new home my dear. Izuku gestured to the whole place. Here you can eat, play, sleep and do whatever you want. Izuku gave Eri a warm smile. What do you want to do? Izuku asked his daughter gently. Iri looked at him in wonder for a few seconds. She was his daughter. She was his daughter. He wanted her and said that she was not a curse. Her new dad loved her. He got her new clothes. He got her delicious food and a candy apple. He gave her a home and now he says she can do whatever she wanted. She could not believe. She started tearing up and hugged him. What's wrong my dear? Izuku asked worried. Did he scare her? Did he bother her? Does she think Overhaul will come back? Thank you so much daddy. Iri whispered and Izuku smiled. He picked the little unicorn in his arms and started walking. Let's get you another candy apple then we'll see what to do. Izuku declared and Iri perked up. Iri was eating her candy apple while sitting in her daddy's lap. She had a father. If this was a dream she doesn't want to wake up. She looked up at her dad to see him working with his computer. He noticed her looking at him and smiled. He gave that smile that gave her warmth and happiness. What's wrong Iri-chan? Don't you like the apple? Izuku asked gently. Iri shook her head. It's yummy. I want to say thank you, Iri said and Izuku patted her head. Iri liked that. It felt nice. Very very nice. If you want anything just tell me. Izuku paused and looked at the big screen in his office. Iri-chan, wanna watch the TV? Izuku asked gently and Iri took a thinking pose. God she looked adorable. He wanted to snap a pic but decided against it. Iri nodded and he picked her up into the sofa in the middle of his big office. Iri liked to have her daddy carrying her around. It felt very nice. Her daddy put her down gently on the very soft sofa. It was very comfy. Izuku picked the remote and started looking for something she could watch until he settled on something. Sailor Moon was a very popular show for kids. He checked the parameters and censored it for kids then he played the show. I'll be right there at my desk dear okay. Iri nodded her head. Call me if you want anything. Anything dear don't be shy. Izuku explained gently with the kindest smile he had and Iri nodded. Izuku walked to his desk to finish his work and as he sat down he glanced at his daughter to see her singing with the show and eating normal apples. How she really likes apples. Well he'll make sure to keep a good amount at the manor. He snapped a picture and put in the group chat. Deku posted a picture. Machai. OMG she's adorable smiling face with hard eyes. Alien queen. She's so precious revolving hearts revolving hearts smiling face with hard eyes. Riot in red. I'll battle the world for her. 
Crow, she is an angel smiling face with halo smiling face with halo smiling face with halo. Bomb, whoever harmed that pipsqueak is dead. Face with symbols on mouth face with symbols on mouth face with symbols on mouth. Vampire queen, is that my new niece? Smiling face with hard eyes smiling face with hard eyes smiling face with hard eyes. Rockstar, what's up father? Who does it feel that you have daughter? Smirking face. Deku, the happiest I've ever been smiling face. Alien queen, so you adopted her dude. Deku, yup thumbs up. Crow, congratulations Shimura clapping hands clapping hands party popper party popper. Machai, shotgun for godmother. Beaming face with smiling eyes beaming face with smiling eyes beaming face with smiling eyes. Alien queen, wait I want to be. Confounded face confounded face confounded face. Machai, sorry dear finders keepers. Beaming face with smiling eyes beaming face with smiling eyes beaming face with smiling eyes. Bomb, well I'm the favorite uncle object and you die skull and crossbones skull and crossbones skull and crossbones. Alien queen, I'll get her lots of stuffed animals. Vampire queen, way ahead of Yamina Chan. Money mouth face money mouth face money mouth face. Machai, so it's official? She's a Shimura. Thinking face. Deku, bet beaming face with smiling eyes beaming face with smiling eyes beaming face with smiling eyes. Riot in red, manly. Flexed biceps light skin tone flexed biceps light skin tone flexed biceps light skin tone. Izuku stopped texting when he heard the bell ring. Izuku looked at the camera through his computer and saw it was the limousine so he opened the door. He walked to his daughter and she noticed him. Yes daddy, Yuri asked and Izuku smiled. He picked her up and held her in his arms as he started to walk out of the study. Well it's time to meet you aunt Suri-chan I promise that they are very nice and will love you just like me. Izuku cooed and Yuri nodded. She was hesitant but still accepted. Izuku walked to the entrance of the manor to see Melissa and Himiko carrying a lot of bags no doubt full of clothes for her. He'll have to thank them later for the help. The two girls saw him and their faces lit up in excitement. Himiko was the first to speak as she came closer. Hello Uri-chan I'm Himiko. Call me auntie. Himiko said cheerfully. Yuri looked at her and nodded hesitantly. Himiko's smile faltered a little but she understood that the girl was a bit scared. Melissa came closer and introduced herself. Hello my dear. I'm Melissa. Call me whatever you want and if you need anything let me know. Melissa said kindly and Yuri nodded again. Well let's get her to try the new stuff we got her. Himiko exclaimed. I'll take the things for her room upstairs, Alfred said as he carried some bags upstairs. Let's start with the unicorn onesie. Melissa chirped and the two girls nodded. Yuri was happy. Her aunties were very nice and they loved her. Her daddy was right. He didn't lie to her. He never called her a curse. He never said she was his property or yelled at her. He was very calm and nice. He was super nice and always kind. As they sit in the dinner table Yuri sit in Izuku's lap and the two girls snicker. Yuri tried all the types of food on the table and it was delicious. Mr. Alfred was very nice to her and so were her aunties. They called her cute and hugged her a lot. They said lots of nice things and gave her lots of nice stuff. After dinner Yuri was carried to her room by her daddy. He put her in bed and sit beside her in a chair. He read her a story and kissed her on the forehead then wished her a good night. After he left Yuri smiled to herself in joy. Today was the best. Chapter 32 The Father's Rage Summary In which the shy Hisekai fucks up and gets fucked up. Chapter Text Izuku put Uri in her bed and read her a bedtime story. He read it slowly and explained any word Uri didn't understand. He then after finishing the story gave the innocent child a kiss to her forehead then he walked out of the room. Uri was safe and sound. Now he'll punish the shy Hisekai scumbags that served overhaul. The bastard should be thankful he's taken straight to Tartarus because if Izuku got his hands on him overhaul will be begging to die when he was done. Izuku shook these thoughts away as he walked to his study. He now has to focus on destroying the Yakuza. He'll destroy Chizaki in the court later but he has to finish his underlings first. He must gain info on these scumbags and know every detail about Chizaki's men then organize a raid on them. He'll get the info from Jiren. He was a trusted information broker. Pretty but trusted and Izuku will get the info he needs. He was walking until he caught up to Melissa also going to the base. Is the precious unicorn asleep? Melissa asked fondly and Izuku nodded. Yes she is. I will do all I can to make her forget about overhaul and we should assign a therapist for her. Izuku said and Melissa frowned. Izuku told me about Uri and her past. Himiko has school starting tomorrow so I sent her to bed. It's just you and me. Melissa and Izuku sighed. It was then they reached his study. Izuku went and opened the secret entrance to the base. They walked down the stairs to the cave base of their operations. Izuku went to his suit chamber and grabbed his suit. As he suited up Melissa started the green computer and put on her earpiece. After Izuku suited up he sat beside Melissa and prepared himself to tell the story. He really didn't want to bring it up. The idea of his child being tortured like that made him sick and furious. He'll protect her. He'll get her justice. He'll avenge her no matter the price. So, Melissa started. Izuku sighed. 
Well, Izuku offered her a glass of water and some tissues. It started when her quirk manifested Izuku started. After the story was told Melissa was crying and Izuku could only rub her back soothingly and let her rant and rage. I'll make sure these bastards are destroyed. She yelled as she looked at her computer. I'll get that monster Chizaki destroyed in all the legal ways possible. Hope he gets six feet underground. Melissa trailed off. Guess wishes comes true huh? Melissa whispered in shock. Izuku looked at the screen in shock and slight satisfaction to see that Overhaul was killed. Now one of his troubles was dealt with he'll focus on the Yakuza. Izuku walked to the platform as Melissa brought the green jet. Izuku got into the driver's seat. He put the coordinates of Jiren's office and took off to Kamino. The trip to Kamino was uneventful, and the only thing he did was speaking to Melissa, mostly planning how to take care of Iri. As he got into the destination he dropped from the jet and dove down until he was in the height to glide. As he landed in the ground he looked at the office in anger. He'll get the info he needs. Jiren grinned as he counted his money. He made a good deal with a man for some dirt on his rival in business and he got the man to pay a lot. Then he won a big bet in the underground fights and doubled his gain. Life is good, Jiren said with grin. Yeah but for how long? Jiren jumped to see the person he feared the most after all for one. Green Shadow was looking at him. What do you want? Jiren asked with a scowl. He tried to reach a button on his desk. Don't waste our time Jiren your buddies are taking a nap at the front. It'll be a while before they wake up. Green Shadow said calmly. Jiren sighed. What do you want? Jiren asked exasperated. You'll tell me everything you know about the Shai Hisekai and its members. Green Shadow stated and Jiren perked up at that. Oh, and what do I get in return? Jiren asked intrigued seeing the chance for more money. I won't throw you in jail. Green Shadow said with killing intent filling the air. Jiren gasped and fell to his chair. Good point. I'll tell you what you want to hear. Let's start with the eight percepts of death. Jiren started. And that's all I know. Jiren said after good time of speaking. Green Shadow hummed in appreciation. Good job. This is useful. Green Shadow said as he threw Jiren a bag. Jiren picked up as he looked at it. His eyes widened to see 200,000 yens in cash inside the bag. Why didn't you just pay? Jiren snapped exasperated. Green Shadow deadpanned. Because you're a greedy bastard and would have held information. It's your fault that I need to scare the info out of you. Green Shadow explained. Jiren gave a sheepish look. Sounds about right. Jiren admitted. Green Shadow turned to leave. Sir Knight I sit in his chair doing some paperwork until he felt something. Good evening Sasaki-san. Sir turned to see Green Shadow leaning on his window. The man picked up seeing the green shadow in the flesh in his office. Whenever the guy appeared it means something big is going on. So he felt anxious about what he wanted. Sir stood up and adjusted his glasses. Welcome green shadow. Do you want some tea? Night I asked and green shadow shook his head. No I want justice for the girl Shimura saved from that scum Chizaki. Green shadow said subconsciously leaking some killing intent. Night I stiffened and nodded. Well I heard of Chizaki's crimes and I'm horrified. Night I admitted. But do I have anything useful? Night I asked hoping he was right. Green Shadow gave him a flash drive full of all the info Jiren gave him. Tell All Might to give those bastards hell for me. Green Shadow said and Night I nodded. Rest assured. They will be dealt with by morning. Night I said with confidence. His piece said Green Shadow jumped from the window. Night I quickly looked to see him gliding in the air and landing on a jet. So the people weren't exaggerating about his recourses. He might use that to know his identity but he respected the boy enough not to pry and he was busy anyway with this new info on the Shai Hisekai. God bless the boy. The next day. Hello. Am I a dog? A bear? A mouse? Who cares? I'm joining the raid. Nedzu cackled as he crossed the threshold into Night Eye's meeting room. Nedzu cackled. Aizawa groaned, plopping his head onto the table. Night Eye sighed, standing near the projector screen. Before we begin, does anyone have any questions? I have one, actually. Rocklock spoke up. What's Green Shadow doing here? Is there another terrorist threat? He asked worried. Green Shadow shook his head. No just some monsters I wanted to punish myself. Green Shadow answered. The young vigilante holds vital information regarding the case I'm about to present. Night I responded. If that is all, please take your seats everyone. Izuku took a look around. Most of the pros they called were trustworthy here, including Ryukyu, Fakim, and their apprentices. New additions included Gang Orca, Kamui Woods, and Mount Lady. They had asked Mirko to come, but apparently Nejire's parents had a restraining order on her for some reason, so that was a bust. They couldn't have all might in the raid because having the symbol of peace joining them would attract far too much attention. The reason I called you all here is because of the Yakuza group, the Shai Hasekai. Night I began. Yakuza. Those guys are still around. Fatgum exclaimed. Indeed. And thanks to information given to us by Green Shadow here, we've learned that they've become far more dangerous than anyone could hope to expect. Green Shadow. Green Shadow took a deep breath, stealing his nerves as he walked calmly to the front of the room. 
through methods that were a bit extreme. I learned that the Shai Hasekai are developing a drug capable of completely destroying someone's quirk. There was a few moments of silence before the room broke out into chaos. A quirk-destroying drug. Is that even possible? Mr. Brave asked in alarm. I think you'll all find yourselves more concerned with how the drug is made. Izuku took a deep breath. The Shai Hasekai's leader, Kai Chisaki, codename, Overhaul, has in his possession a young girl by the name of Iri. Chisaki claims Iri is his daughter, but that's actually a lie to manipulate her and make it easier to retrieve her if she manages to escape. Iri's quirk is called Rewind. It's an extremely powerful and dangerous quirk that allows Iri to basically rewind anything organic back to a previous state. Picture a seed growing into a sapling, then to a full-grown tree, all with the passage of time. Iri's quirk does the exact opposite of that, turning the full-grown tree back into a sapling, then to a seed. It could be used to undo a severed spine or regain a lost limb at the cost of being a bit younger. But what makes Iri's quirk especially dangerous is the fact that it has to limits to how much it can rewind something. When Iri's quirk first manifested, she accidentally rewound her own father out of existence. He could see many faces around the room for pale at that revelation. This caused her mother to suffer a breakdown. Emotionally and verbally abusing her before handing her over to Iri's grandfather, the previous leader of the Shai Hasekai, until Chisaki ousted him from the position. What does this Iri girl have to do with the quirk-destroying drug? Ryukyu asked. Under the right circumstances, Iri's quirk can even undo evolution. Izuku explained. Chisaki's quirk is called overhaul. It allows him to tear apart and rearrange matter with the touch of his fingers. Oh god, don't tell me Fakum began in realization. Shisaki is using his quirk to rip Iri apart and put her back together, using the blood and cells he collects to develop his quirk-destroying drug. The room exploded into an uproar. None looked more angry than Gang Orca, who Green Shadow was aware had a soft spot for children. This Iri girl, how old is she exactly? Rukyu asked. She's about five. That just seemed to enrage the room further. Hold up. This information seems like the kind of stuff you'd want to keep secret at all cost. Rocklock spoke up. How did Green Shadow even come across this stuff? Not important. We need to focus on the raid. Green Shadow said. Is the girl alright? Mukyu asked worried. Deku Shimura saved the girl. She ran by him by chance. He tasered Chizaki and adopted the child. But it's still our responsibility to rip apart the Shai Hisekai. Green Shadow said and everyone nodded. This is it. Night I murmured as the heroes stared down the Shai Hasekai's main base. A battalion of police officers also lay in waiting nearby, and another group of heroes and police were watching Chisaki's emergency exit. That's Joy Irinaka, Green Shadow explained. Weird to see him out of costume. His quirk, mimicry, lets him merge his mind and body with inanimate objects and take control of them. Normally, he can't control anything larger than a refrigerator. But if he takes trigger, he can control the environment around him, even turn it into a maze. In other words Aizawa began. We need to take him out now, or he'll end up being a major pain in the ass. Exactly. Right, Torino, let's go. Yep. The two heroes took off towards the direction Irinaka had gone. Well as they go I'm putting on my battle gear. Green Shadow said as he pressed a button on his belt and the jet passed in the sky dropping an airdrop. Green Shadow grabbed it and dragged into the building. What battle gear? Night Eye asked. Well my costume is designed for stealth not combat. This is for battles. Green Shadow said. He went and added the new armor on his bunny suit. It was armor from head to toe. With material hard and light. With extreme shock absorption and impact recoil aspects as well as kinetic energy gathering for finishing moves and both heat and cold resistance. It was also resistant to electricity. In the head the helmet had a big V similar to All Might's hairstyle. If his stealth costume was like a racer head then this armor was All Might like. His sisters were geniuses and they worked on this for a good few months and he was more than happy to use it to destroy those bastards. He came out a few minutes later just as Aizawa and Gran Torino returned. Aizawa took a look at the costume Izuku was wearing and raised a brow. What the hell kid? You look like a small mite. Aizawa deadpanned. Well this my battle armor. I can literally tank smashes from all might. Green Shadow said. They looked surprised but accepted the information. I take it Irinaka had been dealt with. Green Shadow asked. We have officers leading him away in quirk suppressing cuffs now. Aizawa confirmed. You should have seen his face when we came down on him and he couldn't use his quirk. Torino laughed. As the signal was given Green Shadow charged. His armor had kinetic boosters giving him three times more speed and reflexes. All in all the Shai Hisekai are going to go down painfully. They ran inside the building and Green Shadow kicked the front door open. He ran along heroes such as Eraserhead, Rukyu and Nejire Chan to the inside. They were encountered by some men but Izuku used his new speed and his combat skills to take them all down with quick strikes. As they ran they reached Chizaki's office where his right-hand man is and they paused. What is it? Rukyu asked. 
Something behind the door. Eraser. Aizawa moved into place as Green Shadow lifted his leg and kicked the door. Bending the door open as Aizawa activated his quirk. A man in white robes lunged at them with a knife. Green Shadow lunged forward, striking the man in the jaw and sending him sprawling to the floor. Aizawa's capture scarf shot out, binding the man. Hari Kirono. Izuku explained. Codename, Chronostasis. His quirk lets him slow down a person's movements to a near standstill. He's Chisaki's right-hand man. Izuku walked up, kicking the white-haired man to the floor and knocking him out. After restraining the bastard they went deeper into the base. Green Shadow shoved Nejire out of the way as the wall next to where she had been standing exploded, and a walking mass of muscle walked out. Kendo Rappa. Izuku growled. Who the hell are you? A. Doesn't matter. Fight me. Rappa threw out a barrage of punches that shattered the wall where Izuku and Nejire had just been standing. Go, I'll catch up. Izuku ordered. But, that's an order senpai. But what do I do about the big force field thing? Green Shadow blinked, turning to see a large barrier was blocking them from progressing. A man stood behind it. Hekaji Tengai. Green Shadow growled. I don't know how you know our names, but your road ends here. Rappa, deal with them. Don't tell me what to do. Green Shadow dodged another barrage of punches. Senpai, see about breaking through that barrier. There's a limit to how much they can take. K, don't even think about it girly. Rappa threw another barrage of punches at Nejire, who barely dodged. Hold on Rappa, why are you attacking Senpai? Green Shadow asked, an idea formulating. It's me you wanna fight, even more than you wanna fight Chisaki. Hey, Rappa paused, turning to Izuku. And why's that? What makes you a better opponent than the boss? Well, you see Izuku began, a grin forming. I'm All Might's personal apprentice. Oh hell yeah. Rappa suddenly seemed to forget about Nejire's existence as he stormed at Izuku. Fight me G-R-E-N-I. Indianapolis smash. Green Shadow cried as he and Rappa traded fierce blows with each other. Izuku's armored costume was nullifying the damage. One of Izuku's punches broke through Rappa's defense and clocked the large man in the face. Sending him flying into Tengai's barrier, which, already weakened from Nejire's continued assault, shattered as Rappa crashed into the man. Izuku stumbled, spitting up a bit of blood. His body bruised and beaten. Are you okay Green Shadow? Nejire asked with concern. I'll live. Izuku coughed. My armor cushioned the worst of the blows. Rappa suddenly laughed as he sat up, still sitting on Tengai. Damn kid, you can fight. And you don't rely on cheap tricks like Chisaki with his quirk. Screw that guy, I'm joining you. Is this guy serious? Izuku and Nejire thought in unison. Rappa, get off of me. Tengai wheezed under Rappa's weight. You had better not be serious about defecting. If the boss finds out then. Shut the hell up. Rappa snapped, clocking the man in the head and knocking him out cold. So anyway, can I join you? I wanna fight you again. We can fight some other time. Izuku sighed. Head up to the surface and tell the first hero you see that green shadow sent you. Okay. Amajiki grunted as Soramitsu tape devoured his tentacles. The big three member found himself facing a trio of the shy Hasekai's eight precepts and was quickly getting overwhelmed. Damn it. There's no way I can take them on he thought despairingly. Maybe if I can swallow one of you Hojo's crystals. I can said crystal user was promptly knocked out by a fist to the face. Hey buddy. Rappa exclaimed. Green Shadow sent me. I'm joining the heroes so I can fight him again. Both Amajiki and the other precepts blinked at him, dumbfounded. What? They asked in unison. After that the rest of the raid was a crushing success and re got her justice. Izuku and Melissa were satisfied and the family threw a party to celebrate. Chapter 33 Victory Summary Green Shadow watches the results of the successful raid on the Shai Hisekai and enjoys his victory. He got his daughter justice and that was enough. Chapter Text Green Shadow watched in satisfaction as the last of Yakuza were dragged into the police cars and quirk suppressing cuffs. He was taking off his armor until Sir Knight I came. He was wearing the armor on top of his normal suit so he didn't mind. That was crushing success we made in the raid. Knight I stated and Izuku nodded. Indeed. It's all thanks to the heroes and police as well as your and Nedzu's supreme strategizing and planning. Green Shadow spoke matter of factly. Knight I frowned. Not in the slightest. Your information about the eight precepts were accurate. You took a good part in strategizing and I was right to follow your recommendation on the who to invite to the raid. You also had a big part as a combatant and arrested four of the eight percepts on your own. You are obviously the MVP of this raid. That's what I believe. Night I spoke. Green Shadow stayed silent for a bit then he spoke. Thank you. I still disagree but I won't argue. Green Shadow said as he took off the last piece of his armor and put it back in the chamber of the airdrop. As they walked outside Izuku dragged the airdrop with him. He was surprised to see that the heroes were still there. Mainly Gran Torino, Eraserhead, Fakum and Rukiu as well as the three interns. They noticed him and their faces lit up. Nejire was the first to react as she bolted right next to him. Green Shadow. You were amazing out there. 
What was that armor? You look like All Might. Do you have multiple suit? Do you have suits for the weather? Mirio then pulled her back a little and calmed her down. God bless the young boy's kindness. Izuku was used to speaking quickly so he caught most of what she said. Thank you Najire san That armor was special for battles. Yes it was designed to be like All Might. No I don't have multiple suits. And my suit works for all weathers. Green Shadow responded to her questions. The heroes looked at him in shock. Green Shadow tilted his head. What's wrong? Green Shadow asked in confusion. You actually followed Najire chan speaking. Ryukyu asked bewildered and Green Shadow nodded. Red Hood speaks the same way so I'm used to it. Green Shadow responded simply. Najire beamed. Can I meet her? Najire asked and Green Shadow nodded causing the girl to cheer in happiness. Well that aside, the racer had cut in. Where did you get this much information? It's absurd even for you. The Yakuza mess started yesterday and you call at night carrying all this info. How? The racer had questioned and Green Shadow shrugged. I threatened and beat up a well-known information broker to get what I need. I am no hero so protocols of interrogation are nothing to me. One perk of being a vigilante. Green Shadow explained and Gran Torino whistled. Impressive. The older man complimented and Green Shadow nodded in appreciation. So how does it feel to get into a raid? Fat Gum asked. Yes I'm curious. Rukyu added. Was it nice green buddy? Mirio asked. In response Green Shadow grabbed his metal face mask that resembled a scary grin surprising everyone. He pulled it down to his neck and they were further surprised by the soft smile on his face. I helped put monsters in jail and got a little girl the justice she deserves. I'm happy, Green Shadow said softly, and they were surprised by how kind his voice was under the voice changer of his mask. Everyone even Eraser had smiled and nodded their heads in agreement. Well let's celebrate. Mirio cheered and Green Shadow shook his head. I have to go. Sorry and thank you for the help. Green Shadow pressed a button on his belt and the jet was above them in a second. The jet fired a cable that grabbed the airdrop and pulled back in and Green Shadow grappled into the jet. With a final wave he entered his jet and took off. He has a jet. Mirio, Nejire and Fatkum exclaimed in unison, shocked and amazed if the stars in their eyes was anything to go by. He's kinda cool. Tamaki Amajiki whispered and Eraserhead grumbled in agreement. Well time to wrap things up here. Come on everyone Green Shadow left the rest for us, Sir said and everyone agreed. Izuku exited the jet with a smile on his face. He was happy to the point he felt like celebrating the downfall of the Yakuza. He walked to Melissa who was smiling widely. She held up her hand for a high five and Izuku went with it. Excellent. Now let's speak with Iri-chan. Melissa declared and Izuku nodded with a smile. As he was taking off his suit when Melissa spoke up. So how was the armor Izu? Melissa asked curious and Izuku gave her a grateful smile. Excellent to say the least but it seems that it can be overwhelmed by a barrage of attacks. Izuku noted and Melissa hummed softly in thought. Well I guess me and Mei-chan will have to add shock nullification for when the armor gets overwhelmed, and maybe get you shock gloves with electricity in them for strong opponents, Melissa said in a thinking pose. Izuku smiled. Well we can worry about it later. Right now I got a cute little unicorn to play with. Izuku declared as he walked to the stairs into the manor. Melissa giggled and followed him to the manor. They'll call the family and celebrate this occasion. Thiri woke up a bit tired because she wanted to sleep more. The bed was very comfy. Her eyes widened as she looked around frantically. She was in the room. The room of her daddy's home. Her room in her home. She got up from her bed and was about to come down to the ground when the door opened. Thiri squeaked and looked at the door surprised. She quickly relaxed to see that it was Mr. Alfred coming with a food tray. Mr. Alfred was nice to her and he gave her delicious food. He was very kind and Iri liked him a lot. Good morning young lady. I brought your food. Alfred said removing the cover from the dishes. Aaron's mouth watered at the sight of the food. She didn't even know where to start. All the food tasted great. She grabbed a spoon and went to eat the soup. Her daddy told her that it was healthy to start the meal with the soup. Then after she finished it she went to the rice. She grabbed the chopsticks with a bit of difficulty but she managed to eat. Then she ate the delicious fish and it was all yummy. Her daddy gives her the best food. Thank you Mr. Iri whispered and Alfred smiled kindly. And a time young lady. Alfred said and gave her another plate. Iri perked up to see that it was filled with apple pieces. It was cut into cubes and Iri saw some sugar in it. Iri looked at the dessert in awe and Alfred chuckled. He grabbed the remote and started looking for something for her to watch and settled on what she was watching yesterday. Among the things in her room she has her own TV and closet with lots of clothes and she has a lot of papers and crayons to draw and write. Her daddy and aunties filled her room with stuffed animals and toys. Master Izuku is at work but he should be back soon so enjoy the show until he's back and call me if you need anything. Alfred said as he exited the room. She sat down in the carpet and watched the very nice show. She wondered where her daddy was right now. He works somewhere she knows that but she doesn't know where or what he does. When he comes she'll ask him. 
She kept watching the nice show and played with her stuffed animals. Izuku and Melissa walked through the halls of the, the manor with their heads held high. They were happy with today's accomplishment and they were going to invite the whole family. You go see Yuri Chan and I'll call May, the Bakugas and Auntie and Co. Melissa said and Izuku nodded. Yes please but don't tell them about Yuri Chan. I want to surprise them. Izuku smirked and she deadpanned. Yeah just don't get them a heart attack. Melissa said with an eye roll. Yagi sighed and opened his eyes. He came face to face with a file he had spent the last few days reading over and over. He read the large name on the cover of the file. Myro Tagata. Nedzu had been kind enough to send over the young hero's file after he discovered Sir Naida had recommended him. Yagi had been over the file several times in the past few days yet despite that he still found himself reaching out and flicking open the papers. Bright blue eyes stared back at him. The school photo taking up most of the first page as well as a lot of basic information. Tagata's age, home address, quirk, things like that. Speaking of quirks Yagi had been impressed by Tagata's control of his complex quirk. Apparently the boy had nearly been kicked out of UA in his first year due to his lack of control. However after some tutoring by Nainai Tagata now had precise control of his quirk and could use it to deadly effect. He had gone from being the only hero student to be knocked out of the first round in his first year sports festival to completely dominating his class in power even though the second year just started. It was astonishing. But now as he heard how young Shimura defeated the Yakuza boss and saved an abused traumatized girl just with his taser even though he didn't have his suit dot dot when he could have gotten hurt just to save that girl. The boy embodied what it means to be a hero. He wanted him as a successor but the boy refused one for all. He wanted to stay like he was now. And Yagi respected his wish. Maybe he can still convince him and if he couldn't he'll get his opinion on young Tagata. The boy was a genius dot dot and oh beyond genius and must have some ideas. He was just invited to a celebration for the downfall of the Yakuza Nedzu told him about Shimura-kun's huge help with info and combat. And Yagi will attend. Come on guys, let's go. Mitsuki urged as she speed walked to the door of the manor. Katsuki rolled his eyes. Yeah hag stop that Izu won't revoke the damn invitation if we fucking take more time to come. Katsuki said with a huff. Well Izuku seemed thrilled with the destruction of the Yakuza. He was a part of the raid right? Masaru asked. My bay in a raid with heroes. Unbelievable. Inda said with pride. Yeah he's thrilled because the bastards were using a five-year-old girl to create a weapon. Katsuki growled in rage. What? The adults exclaimed in shock and horror. Yeah kinda immoral so Bunny gathered some pros and police then stormed in and destroyed them thoroughly. May chimed in. They got to the door and Mitsuki knocked to have Himiko open it with a beaming smile. Come on in guys, I need you to meet someone. Himiko urged dragging Katsuki from the wrist. Everyone followed close behind. Who are we meeting? Inta asked curious. Someone new, Melissa said with a grin. The adults looked confused until they saw Izuku coming holding. A little girl. May gasped as she appeared in front of them with a beaming smile on her face. Bunny, who's this? She's so cute. May squealed and Uri stiffened. May go easy on her. She's not comfortable around people. Izuku said as he walked to everyone. Hey brat, who's the precious unicorn? Mitsuki asked. Everyone this is Iri. She was kept hostage with the Yakuza until we met by chance. I saved her from the boss with some luck. Izuku paused and grinned. And long story short I adopted her. Izuku added cheerfully. There was a long pause as everyone processed the information. I'm a grandma. Inko exclaimed with joy. Izuku nodded and everyone seemed to be overjoyed with the little girl. Oh god she's the cutest. Mitsuki said. Congrats Izuku. You'll make a great father, Masaru said with a smile. Well I'm her uncle now. If anyone hurts her give me a call and I'll blow them to hell. Katsuki declared and Himiko giggled. After that the celebration was a long night of laughter and joy. Everyone tried to get as close to Iri as possible but she stayed glued to Izuku which no one minded at all. All in all it was a great day for Iri and Izuku. Chapter 34 The Symbol of Evil Summary Shota catches a drug dealer that knew much, too much and Eraserhead finds himself dealing with what Green Shadow warned him to drop. Chapter Text Namasa slammed his head on the table of his new office. He did it. The kid did it and now Namasa is stuck as the goddamned police commissioner. He was just appointed in like last time just a week after. The old police commissioner was a corrupt sure but how the hell did Green Shadow uncover it? It was just two weeks since the Yakuza raid. Did the kid ever take some rest? Well considering he's a mini eraser head the answer is probably no. Tashinori was thrilled when Namasa was told he'll be the new commissioner. Heck, the guy invited him and some pros he knows for a celebration. And Shouta kept giving that sales shit-eating grin all the night. By now he wouldn't be surprised if they were working together or even somehow related. Namasa let out a sigh as he grabbed his cup of coffee and sipped from it. It's been less hectic this past few days if he excluded the while past commissioner mess with the media. And to be fair he was happy with that. He knows that all for one is alive thanks to Green Shadow and he'll have to be prepared for anything that bastard tries to pull. 
Shota tightened his capture weapon and pushed the villain more firmly against the wall. It's illogical to resist. Just tell me what I need to know. Dude, it's just some drugs. The villain said. If you have a problem with that then maybe you should get out more. I've got a couple samples that'd be good for a first timer. Shota rolled his eyes. Yes, offer to sell drugs to the hero that's arresting you. And honestly, if it were just party drugs, I probably wouldn't care that much. But this is Trigger, so I'll ask you one more time, where do you get the drugs? Fuck you. Shota sighed. Fine, have it your way. He dialed Tsukachi and waited until the commissioner's half-awake voice groaned over the line. Could you send a car? I've got a perp to bring in for processing and interrogation. Tsukachi looked up from his paperwork as a racer walked in the villain he'd just arrested. The guy was probably a low-level dealer like the others that Eraser had brought in, but there was always the hope that the next villain would know who was behind Trigger. It was disappointing that after Green Shadow took down the Yakuza the people still had Trigger to create instant villain. Interrogation room 8 is open, Eraser. You can put him in there, Namasa said casually. Eraser grunted in acknowledgement and dragged the thug toward the back of the station as Tsukachi poured them both some coffee. He'd have to go interrogate the guy later, since he was one of the people on the trigger investigation, but that could wait a bit until this paperwork was done. Leaving the perps to wait for a few minutes helped establish control of the situation anyway. Shota finally sat down on the other side of his desk and grabbed the coffee. Then grimaced, Tsukachi, you didn't mention that the station had switched out their coffee for paint thinner. Tsukachi just laughed. Oh, you're just mad that Musutafu doesn't have your favorite cat cafe. What can I say? The Hata brothers make a mean cup of coffee. Shota shrugged. You got those forms? I want to get this over with as fast as possible. Tsukachi shook his head, but grabbed the villain intake form from the drawer at his right and handed it to Shota, who started to fill it out with both annoyance and boredom. Paperwork wasn't fun by any means, and Shota would rather be patrolling the streets looking for more info for the trigger investigation, but bureaucracy was a part of life, so he had to put up with it. Green Shadow was into something when he said that being a vigilante had some perks the little bastard never filled a form before. A week later Shadow looked over the file for the snake villain as he waited for Tsukachi to arrive so they could interrogate him. Of all the trigger dealers he'd shaken down over the past few years, most just evaded his questions and a few tried to run, but no one else had shot up before he had the chance to ask a single question. In Shadow's line of work, a reaction like that meant that the person had something to hide. According to his files, the snake villain was named Don Yamakari and some mid-level dealers had pointed Shouta his way, saying that he sold them the drugs. He couldn't be anywhere near the top. He didn't have anywhere near enough connections to bring the drugs over from America. But he was the highest level dealer Shouta had found so far. Everything pointed to Yamakari knowing something. Shouta took a deep breath and reminded himself that Trigger often induced rage. So Yamakari probably hadn't been thinking entirely clearly when he almost killed a pro when he was caught. Thankfully Green Shadow came for the rescue and took down the bastard and saved the pro. Shouta tried to ignore the voice in his head that said that he'd been thinking clearly when he dosed himself, and he clearly knew what would happen. It wouldn't do any good to punch Yamakari in the face the moment he entered the interrogation room. But that didn't mean Shouta had to like the guy. Sukaki calmly walked through the door to the station and put his trench coat on the chair at his desk. Sorry I'm late, eraser. I was having lunch with an old friend. Shouta grunted in response. Are you ready? Tsukuachi nodded and took the file, then led Shouta to the room where Yamakari was waiting. They had to pass through the observation room first, which meant that Shouta got a good look at the villain through the glass. He had been expecting the guy to be defiant, considering how hard he'd fought to avoid being arrested. But instead Yamakari was pale and jittery. He looked terrified. Tsukachi saw him staring. He's been like that ever since you brought him in. We've tried telling him he's safe here, but he obviously doesn't believe us. It definitely lends credence to your assumption that he actually knows something. Shouta nodded and followed Tsukachi through the door. They both sat down at the table opposite Yamakari, who looked even worse close up. One of his hands was tapping at the table and a thin sheen of sweat coated his forehead despite the fact that the room was air-conditioned. He had information, that much was certain. The only problem now was getting him to talk. All right, you know why you're here. Tsukachi began. The racer had picked you up a few days ago for trigger possession and assaulting a pro hero, both of which have prison sentences attached. However, the law is willing to be lenient and take time off your sentence if you provide us with useful information. Yamakari shook his head, I don't know nothing. You fought tooth and nail to avoid answering my questions. Shouta said dryly, who sells you the trigger? I don't know what you're talking about. Yamakari glanced up at the camera and Shouta frowned. Was he scared of dirty cops? That couldn't be. Sure, the trigger operation was growing. But villains had to have a significant amount of power to pull a cop to their side and that took time. Trigger had only been in Japan a few years, so he had to be scared of someone else. We could try to find a way to sweeten the deal. Tsukachi tried. 
Surely there's something that would make your life more comfortable behind bars. Maybe protective custody. Doesn't matter how comfortable a cell is if you never live to see it. Yamakari muttered. We have the resources to protect you. Shouta said. Whoever's behind Trigger, they can't be powerful enough to reach you and witness protection. You're underestimating him. Yamakari said darkly. You think it's just some guys in their mom's basement, but that couldn't be farther from the truth. You don't know what you're dealing with. Shouta looked at Tsukachi. Who leaned forward, then tell us. Who are you so afraid of? I. Yamakari hesitated, then slammed his mouth shut. No, I'm not saying nothing else. Well then I guess we'll just have to learn the hard way. Tsukachi stood up. Come on, eraser. This guy obviously doesn't want to tell us anything. It's his fault if we die because we didn't know who to avoid. Shouta stood. He wasn't sure Hamasaki was going to be so easily manipulated. But Tsukachi had already made his move and, well, it was worth a try. They certainly weren't going to get anything by bargaining. To his surprise, they had hardly opened the door to leave when Yamakari spoke up. No one's ever seen him. Shouta and Tsukachi shared a glance, then closed the door and sat back down. It's just one man, Tsukachi asked. Behind the whole trigger operation, it's bigger than you think. Yamakari said softly, it's not just trigger, but just stop looking into it. He's too powerful, you'll never stand a chance. So the man behind the Japanese trigger operation had a fearsome reputation. It wasn't the first time Shouta had run into a villain who used his reputation to make sure people didn't fight back. Most of the time, those guys were all bark and no bite. They talked up their quirks and connections, but were B-ranked villains at the worst, not the S-ranked ones they made themselves out to be. Do you have a name? Tsukachi asked. So we know who to avoid. Hamasaki shook his head. Nobody knows his name, but they call him the symbol of evil. Chapter 35 The Symbol of Evil and the Guardian of Japan Summary Green Shadow sees the biggest threat for Japan making his move and Eraserhead wonders what the hell did he jump into. Chapter Text Yamakari shook his head. Nobody knows his name, but they call him the symbol of evil. Shouta narrowed his eyes. The symbol of evil. Like a play on the symbol of peace. No wonder people were so scared of this guy if he made himself out to be All Might's equal. He glanced over at Tsukachi, surprised to see fear in his expression as well. He had to know that this symbol of evil was bluffing, right? Suddenly, a piercing alarm split the air, making all three of them flinch. Sansa came running into the room not a second later, fur on end as he yelled, There's a villain attack right outside. We need all hands on deck. Shouta swore and ran outside, hands already on his capture weapon. There was a small crowd outside and civilians were screaming as they ran away from the dozen or so minor villains that were attacking at random, like they were trying to do the greatest damage in the least amount of time. The media vultures were already starting to pull up and film, though they at least had the good sense to stay away from the main fight. The villains were more like thugs, but there were still enough of them to be dangerous if Shouta didn't take them down quickly. He activated his quirk and looked at the closest one, some guy with bullets shooting out of his fingers, then quickly wrapped him up and flung him toward the waiting police, then started in on the next one. Rock Lock had turned up while Shouta had been fighting, so he managed to take one of the villains down by locking a rope in place around him. Between the two of them, it only took them another 10 minutes to round up all the villains and get them into police custody. It wouldn't have taken so long if there weren't so many of them. Gangs hadn't been a problem since All Might Beam number 1, so how had so many thugs decided to attack the police station at the same time? They had to be pretty stupid to attack a place that they knew was filled with police. Even if they weren't scared of the cops, pro heroes were always in and out of the station, so why attack? It just didn't make sense. Slowly, they managed to get all the villains off the street and into the holding cells inside the station. There was going to be so much paperwork. Thankfully most of it would be done by the police themselves. But still, Shouta wasn't looking forward to it. That could wait, however, until he and Tsukachi finished interrogating Yamakari. The attack had terrible timing. They had just been starting to get useful information when they'd both had to leave to handle the attack. So hopefully they'd be able to just pick up where they left off. Though Shouta wasn't getting his hopes up. It had been a miracle they'd been able to get as much as they had out of the guy, and the attack would probably have spooked him silent. It was annoying. He tracked down Sukachi and together they made their way to the interrogation room. Shouta almost didn't bother looking through the window before entering, but when he did he had to do a double take. He looked at Sukachi to make sure he wasn't seeing things before they both swore and barged into the empty room. This is the same interrogation room, right? He asked. This is where we left him. Yes. Sukachi looked pale. He was still cuffed to the table when we left. Shouta looked more closely at the room. The cuffs were gone as well, which wasn't normal for an escape. Most of the villains who tried would pick the cuffs, then leave them behind so they wouldn't be slowed down by the dead weight. If Shouta didn't know better, he'd almost say that Yamakari had never been there at all. Sukachi was already striding back out into the bullpen, Sansa. 
What happened to the villain we had in interrogation room 6? Shouta followed to see Sansa at the front desk looking through the logbook. It says here he was transferred, but that can't be right. The villains were blocking the front entrance, so I suppose they could have taken him out the back. But the attack was taking up almost all of our manpower. The person who transferred him also forgot to sign their name. Pull up the security feed, Shouta said. The cameras must have caught them leaving. Sansa grimaced. One of the villains' attacks missed their target and hit the power box. We just barely got the lights back on five minutes ago, but the station was in a blackout for most of the attack, so the cameras weren't recording. Sukachi clarified. No, sir. Shouta looked at Sukachi and could tell he was thinking the exact same thing. The attack wasn't random. Neither was the power outage. The entire thing had been engineered by someone who didn't want Yamakari to talk to them. Shouta had been wrong. Whoever was behind the trigger operation was more powerful than he'd thought possible. And the only lead he had was the symbol of evil. Commissioner Tsukachi sighed as they were on top of the police main building. It's been a couple hours since the attack and things calmed down but Shouta was getting a bad feeling. Was this what Green Shadow was worried about? The kid was obviously stressed when they spoke that time on the roof few months ago. Shouta was getting a very bad feeling about this. What are we doing here Commissioner? Shouta asked annoyed. Waiting for me I assume. Both men's heads whipped to the source of the voice to see Green Shadow standing on the top of the roof exit, his cape flying with the wind and his costume blending perfectly with the darkness. Beside him Red Hood was sitting on the top of the entrance kicking her legs back and forth with a big smile. Hey Mr. Eraser and Mr. Commissioner. Red Hood greeted in a cheerful voice. Hello you too. Green Shadow said as they jumped down and walked to them. Shout aside. These kids were good at stealth. What wouldn't he give to have students like them? Thank you for coming this quickly Shadow. Sukachi said stiffly. I told you to drop this case eraser head. I thought you were logical enough to listen. Green Shadow said and Shouta winced. Was he being scolded by a 14 years old boy in a bunny suit? Well this kid could probably beat him so he'll take it. And he did warn him but Shouta didn't listen. I'll look for Yamakari but I have a feeling he'll be nothing but a corpse when I find him. Green Shadow said gravely. Wait, are we after some type of mastermind behind the scenes guy from movies who manipulates people to do what he desires? Red Hood asked. Green Shadow nodded. Eraserhead could see how stressed the kid was. So what are we gonna do Bunny? Red Hood asked. We gather info. We prepare and try to get him before he gets us. Green Shadow said firmly. While you have the support of the police, we should get All Might too. Sukachi nodded. Yeah, let's take down the big old bad fucker. We got the damn geezer Bunny. Red Hood cheered. Green Shadow walked to the ledge and looked at the city with a scowl. So you're moving all for one. You want war. I'll destroy you and all of your followers. Green Shadow growled to himself. This was the silence before the storm. But the question is who will be the one to suffer from it? Green Shadow will make sure his grandmother's killer will be the first one to be destroyed in that storm. 